guys we made it to the weekend welcome welcome to savvy sabs podcast i'm your host sabrina salvati if you are new i want to let you know that savvy sabs podcast is a part of revolutionary blackout network you can catch me there on thursdays for the savvy and jb show and you can catch me here on tuesday thursday friday and every other sunday welcome back fam shout out to everyone watching on youtube rockfin twitter and rumble and it is the weekend and we are going to do the damn thing we got interesting stories tonight i want to start off by giving shout outs to people in the chat what's going on miguel says happy friday shout out to alcus for becoming a savvy member let's give alcus a big whoop whoop Shout out to David says Sabby boycott Delta Airlines because they're now going to start resuming flights to Tel Aviv. Interesting. Shout out to Lauren says running south on Lakeshore Drive heading into town. You live in Chicago? That was a Lakeshore Drive. I think it's in Chicago. Shout out to Mastermind says Lawrence is chasing lights on LSD. <laughs> Be careful, Lawrence. Shout out to Red Six says hello, Sabby. Greetings, Lee Ball says, oh, I thought you meant Lolita Fat Joe, who worked on the production team of modern Star Trek series. No, no, rapper Fat Joe. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Shout out to Hannah G, Don Lemon back question mark. We're going to get well, sort of. <laughs> we'll get into that conversation. Shout out to you, uh, Ani says, hello, Sabby. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday from Uruguay. What is up? Shout out to the international fam in the chat. What's going on, Rodrigo says, Jink is just not a serious actor. I don't get why Bree would want this guy on her side. We'll get into that tonight and we'll talk more about movement building and what that looks like. Shout out to Lorez says, sup, Sabrina, Eric, and Sabby fam. Saw CJ cover Brie and Jink cringe. Haven't followed the Fat Joe story. RFKJ can't really be picking Aaron Rodgers. More reason not to support him. LOL. Smash the like. We'll get into all of that. Shout out to Mima says happy Friday from sunny California. Oh, I would love some sun right now. Yesterday, it was unusually warm for March for Eastern Massachusetts. It was warm, warm. Like I had to turn off the heat yesterday. That's why I had on a, a short sleeve shirt last night when I did this show because it was nice yesterday. Today, it's colder again. <laughs> the cold has come back and uh, it's rainy. Shout out to Sean says, let's hear that amazing beat. Don't you just love that beat? It has like a, uh, I don't know. It has like a Dr. Dre vibe too. It is like, doo -doo 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 -doo. shout out to Retro Gamer says, hello. Greetings, Mark says, Sabby. Shout out to Team Orca says, what you drinking? I have water. I have water in this cup. My dad had someone make this cup for me. It's supposed to be me. I guess it looks like me if my hair was my natural color. Because <laughs> my natural hair color is black but it says Patriots girl on it and stuff like that. But I am drinking water. Shout out to vegan goddess says what an upside down world we live in. So very sad. I agree. Shout out to Yee Yee Chambers says what up everybody. Shout out to new sheep says back streets back. All right. You know, that song never gets old for me. It never gets old for me. I've seen the Backstreet Boys in concert uh, multiple times. Shout out to Steve says, hi again to J uh, Gamer. Uh, what is going on? Joe says, hi, perfect people. Greetings, kill your e Gorgers says, shout outs to Gamer, Sean Miller, Team Orca, Mastermind Hour, and Miguel and says, happy Friday all. Shout out to Eric. Eric is back tonight, says, hey, yo, what do you know? Here we are and here we go. Shout out to Liana, says, hold on. That sounds like a Snoop riff. It has a West Coast beat to it. I like it, right? Shout out to Boogie Boogie Bar, <laughs> says, shooby dooby do. What's going on, Cloudness, says, happy Friday, everyone. Savvy Sabs podcast in full effect. 
Puppies are kicking my ass, but I'm here for this show. I know you're the one in the picture with the puppies. Oh, little pup pups. And shout out to New York says, Sab, if you are in Cali, hit me up. Karaoke podcast revolution. Ha ha ha. Not in Cali, but you know, I'm always up for uh, some karaoke. I like to do karaoke and shout out to Janine says, Hey, Hey, happy Friday. Shout out to team Orca says going to start a revolution from my bed. That is from a song. Going to start a revolution from my bed. Ah, I forget the name of it. And shout out to Julia says, hi, Sabby. Don't forget to hit the like button. Y'all that's right. Start us off right by hitting the like. All right, guys, let's go ahead and give a shout out to Sabby patrons. Thank you so much for the support and for doing the damn thing. If you're interested in being a savvy patron, I have five categories, ultimate, sabinators, there's also sabsters in the heezy for sheezy. See, now you got me saying the Snoop language. I don't know what's happening to me. <laughs> Shout out to savvies as well. And of course, uh, members, thank you guys so much for your support really do appreciate it. And I believe I shouted out the wonderful jewel last night. I'll just need to fix that. Yes. Yes. B it's Oasis. Thank you. Going to start a revolution from my bed. Cause the words that you had into my head. Oh, is that the don't look back? Don't look back at anger. I think that's the name of that song. The nineties music. I'm a nineties music girl. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and give a shout out to Steven. Thank you so much. Thanks for your excellent show and hard work. Keep it going. Savvy. Good vibes to all the fans. Thank you, Steven. And thank you, R. Bailey. Hey, Sab Danvers in the house. What is up fam? Fellow Boston area peep in the chat. What is up and welcome. All right, guys, what are we discussing tonight? Let's go ahead and share that thumbnail. By the way, if you guys have any ideas, because um, I've had this thumbnail uh, thumbnail format for my live streams for quite some time, and I like having the four squares, but if you have an, another idea of something cooler I could do with this, just let me know. I'm not great at graphics. <laughs> but tonight, we are discussing Brianna Joy Gray and Jink Uger left unity. We're going to talk about, is there some type of possibility for left unity? What should that look like? And I'm actually going to show you uh, solutions in reference to this to show you what some of us, like those of us at RBN are already doing in reference to helping people and how we help each other. So I am going to show you a ways forward. We're also going to discuss RFK Jr. Vice President Idea. Ah, you'll see in that picture, there's RFK. That is Aaron Rodgers, quarterback Aaron Rodgers, who I'm very familiar with, football fan in the house. Not a football fan of Aaron Rodgers, though. Just got to make that clear. I don't like him on the football field, but he is a great football player. And of course, that is Jesse Ventura. Say what? We're also going to discuss Fat Joe meets Biden. Oh my God. We're going to talk about this issue with these celebrities meeting people, you know, these politicians and what type of influence they have and why they're given that opportunity in the first place. So we're going to talk about that. And last but not least, we are going to discuss Elon Musk kicks Don Lemon. Jesus, Don Lemon is not having <laughs> a great, I would say, past, what, couple of months. It's just not looking too good for the Don. And for some reason, people continue to trust Elon. Before we get into tonight's stories, I do want to give you an update about a story I covered recently. Uh, I feel like I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't give you this update. This is important. Uh, recently, I covered the story about whistleblower John Barnett, uh, who they found him you know, dead in his, his car, self-inflicted, they said, right? And I told you I didn't believe that. It didn't make sense. Uh, this guy has been 
basically cooperating for the past five years. He worked at Boeing and he saw some things happening on the production side that he had complained to management about, and they decided to just send him to a different faci facility. So this guy is a whistleblower, was a whistleblower. Well, recently a friend of John Barnett just gave us an update about this. And I do want you to hear this uh, before the other stories. It says Boeing whistleblower John Barnett was found dead from self-inflicted gunshot, said his friend Jennifer beforehand, if anything happens to me, it is not suicide. So listen to his friend Jennifer. This is her response to what happened to John Barnett. He said, aren't you scared? And he said, and his voice and his, the way he would talk, uh -uh, no, I ain't scared. Um, he said, but if anything happens to me, it's not suicide. You know, I know that he did not commit suicide. There's no way. He loved life too much. He loved his family too much. He loved his brothers too much to, to put them through what they're going through right now. And he basically told you not to believe it. But aren't you scared? Okay, I just wanted to give you that update. Uh, so apparently his friend Jennifer, uh, basically in this interview, she told them that John told her that if this were to happen, to know that that is not the case. Which is what I had predicted as well. So that is from John Barnett's uh, friend. Her name is Jennifer. So, you know, hopefully there is some type of investigation into this. But I told you I didn't think that this guy would do this. It didn't make any sense. All these years he's been uh, cooperating and following the process. Why would he become afraid all of a sudden now? Right. All right. We are going to get started with our first story, but if you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and start us off right by hitting the like button there. This story here with Don Lemon and Elon Musk, it's a doozy, let me tell you. So we all know that Don Lemon was fired from CNN. He issued a statement on Twitter, then he was kind of quiet for a while. We didn't hear from him. And then there was an announcement that he was actually going to come back into media, but he would be actually starting a show on Twitter slash X uh, with the help of Elon Musk. So similar what happened to Tucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson fired from Fox News, decided to start a show on Twitter with the help of Elon Musk. Well, apparently things did not go according to to plan. And I want to start with this clip here. This is from Brian uh, Stoutler, who also was removed from CNN. Woo! Don Lemon asked Elon Musk about drug use. Here's some of the exchange, plus Lemon's context from out front CNN tonight. And we'll get into other clips as well. So apparently uh, this did not work out for Don Lemon. Apparently he has been uh, fired by Elon Musk, which is interesting. It's like Don Lemon is fired again. But before that happened, he actually interviewed Elon Musk. And people are assuming that it was this interview that actually pushed the button for Elon Musk and made him say, you gotta go. Listen to this. You talk about your ketamine use and, and depression. Have you, you also have said... And the, the reason I, sh I should say, like, the, like, the reason I mentioned... Uh, the uh, Academy of Prescription on the X platform was because I thought maybe this is something that could help other people. Mm -hmm. That's why I mentioned it. You know, obviously, I'm not a doctor, but I would say uh, if someone has depression issues, they should consider talking to their doctor about ketamine instead of SSRIs. Yeah. Very civil conversation, but yeah. that is where it got very personal. Well, it got personal, but I didn't put that out there. He has spoken very freely about his use of those are prescription drugs but about his use of ketamine i would not have brought it up if well, it was, on x if it, he posted it he posted it yeah and so i would not have brought it up because that's someone's personal information so i asked him about it also it it's no secret his drug use or alleged drug use i should say has been extensively written about it by very credible news organizations like the wall street journal and i asked him that and he said listen i have not read the wall street journal i don't read the wall street journal if i i don't have time to uh read about everything that people write about me i would never get anything done but also we, we remember on joe rogan he took a puff of marijuana right and he said it was just right. a joke and i only took one puff elon musk is responsible for satellites for starlink he's responsible for tesla he's responsible for a number of different companies on the 
in the, uh, the stock market. Yep. And um, I, I think that it is important for people to understand his mindset, whether he's using drugs legally or not, and even even if the ones he that he's well, using that's supposed to be. One of the most be, powerful people but, on the planet. But that's what he's one. But but. Okay, let's go ahead and pause here and we'll get into uh, the next clip where you hear more of this interview here. Uh, So it it sounded like to me that apparently, you know, he brought up this or Elon, actually, he's saying in the interview brought up this issue of, I guess, drug use, alleged, excuse me, drug use that Elon Musk has apparently had or whatever. And so this seems to be the the hot button item that Don Lemon is alluding to what he feels uh, may have caused this to actually happen here, which is where. This is Don Lemon actually taking it to X and he's telling people that his show was canceled by Elon Musk. And then after this, he went on to CNN to do that interview there with Aaron. So we'll start with this video here first, where he makes the announcement that he was fired. And then we'll get into the video uh, on CNN. So it's re- really interesting here how things have panned out for Don. Hi, everyone. Elon Musk is mad at me. And I just put out a statement about what happened between him, me, and the interview that he is apparently so upset about. But make no mistake about this. This is going to be my first episode of The Don Lemon Show this coming Monday, March 18th. So make sure you tune in. This does not change anything about the show except for my relationship with Elon and X. And there, there's a whole lot that went down and I'm gonna tell you about in the coming days. I know though that many of you were not happy that I was doing this in the first place and you told me so. I just want you to know that I did this deal because not only do I believe in free speech, but I believed that this was the best possible chance for the work that I'm doing to reach the largest amount of people. So speaking of free speech, right? I thought the first person interview, no brainer, Elon Musk, the man who calls himself a free speech absolutist. Pause right there. So this is a common misconception about Elon Musk, (laughs) because anyone who's actually on Twitter and has been paying attention, this whole idea that Elon Musk is pro free speech, it's BS because he's still suppressing accounts, uh, especially Palestinian voices. He's suppressing those accounts as well. Matt Taibbi has been on the show multiple times. Uh, The last time he was on here recently, I did ask uh, Matt Taibbi about Elon's supposed like free speech. And Matt Taibbi was like, no, he's not pro free speech. He's pro the speech that he likes and wants to hear. So check out that discussion if you didn't have a chance to see it with me and uh, Matt Taibbi. So I don't understand why Don Lemon would still assume at this point in time that Elon Musk uh, is pro free speech. So that was really interesting to me. Don fell for the okie doke. I asked him to do it. He willingly agreed to the interview. Throughout our conversation, I kept reiterating to him that although it was tense at times, I thought it was good for people to see and hear our exchange and that they would learn from our conversation, learn more about him, learn more about me. But apparently, free speech absolutism doesn't apply when it comes to questions about him from people like me. What? It- but he's been doing that, Don. This is the thing, like, People have been censored on Twitter for making criticism about Elon Musk. This is not true. Or excuse me, this is not new. <laughs> like he's been doing this all this time. So I don't think it's just about you, Don Lemon. He's been doing this to other accounts as well. Don's trying to make it just about him. What are we talk about? Why is he so upset? Does he even have a reason to be upset? Make sure you watch it on Monday on YouTube and everywhere you listen to podcasts and you can decide for yourself. You can even watch it on X because I'm still going to post it there and I'm sure others will as well. Oh, Don, Don, Don. So after that announcement, he actually had an interview on CNN uh, with Aaron uh, where he goes into far more detail about what happened with Elon Musk here. It's very interesting to me that people are surprised that a billionaire who controls a platform is not going to try to have some type of limitations towards certain subjects or accounts. Like they all have done it. Uh, Jack, the owner before Elon Musk was also doing it. Uh, And there are certain voices that are elevated uh, on Twitter and there are certain voices that are suppressed. I mean, I, I don't know why people thought this was going to be so much different uh, because Elon was like, well, yeah, I'm against censorship and I'm pro free speech. But Elon Musk changes his mind at the drop of a hat. He says one thing today, he could change his mind tomorrow. So in this interview here, he goes into much more detail. Elon Musk tells Don Lemon, quote, contract is canceled, end quote. 
Now, in a moment, I'm going to speak exclusively with Don Lemon, and he has clips of the nearly hour and a half interview with Musk. Clips like this one that we received from Don's production team. Don, the only reason I'm doing this interview is because you're on the X platform and you asked for it. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I would not do interview with this interview. So you don't think, you, do you think that you wouldn't get in trouble or you wouldn't be criticized for these things? I'm or criticized that constantly. I could care less. We're going to have more clips from Lemon's interview with Musk in a moment. In a statement earlier today, Lemon <sighs> writes in part, quote, there were no restrictions on the interview that he willingly agreed to. We had a good conversation. Clearly, he felt differently. His commitment to a global town square where all questions can be asked and all ideas can be shared seems not to include questions of him from people like me. Now, CNN reached out to X for their comment, and their response is, quote, we reserve the right to make decisions about our business partnerships. And after careful consideration, X decided not to enter into a commercial partnership with the show. Now, this decision coming as Musk had, of course, publicly courted Lemon and has repeatedly made a commitment to free speech when he bought Twitter again and again and again. So let me just pause here for a second. There's something I want to add. I just want people to know that Don Lemon, even though he was fired from CNN, he did receive like a $5 million settlement <laughs> from CNN. So after what he experienced at CNN, why go work for someone else again anyway? You got a $5 million settlement. You had money in the bank before that, I'm sure as well. You could have done exactly what Tucker Carlson did and started your own network. Why go work for someone else again after what happened with CNN? I mean, yes, uh, Tucker Carlson has his show on Twitter as well, but Tucker Carlson also started his own news network. So he's not relying on X. Like Elon can honestly flip the script on him too and say, yeah, I'm not feeling you anymore, bud. He could do the same thing. So I just don't understand if I had the, the, the resources and the networks and connections that Don Lemon did, I would not choose to go work for someone else <laughs> in media again. And even Mehdi Hassan knew better. Mehdi Hassan, what did he do? He decided to start his own media you know, company. So, oh, Don, Don, Don. Well, I think it's very important for uh, there to be an inclusive arena for free speech, uh, where all, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Um, Twitter has become kind of the de facto town square. Free speech is meaningless unless you allow people uh, you don't like to say things you don't like. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. I, I really can't emphasize this enough. We, we must, uh, uh, we must protect free speech, um, and free speech only matters, it's only relevant when it's someone you don't like saying something you don't like. It's damn annoying when someone you don't like says something you don't like. That is a sign of a healthy, functioning uh, free speech situation. Again and again and again, and remember, Musk's ex has over a quarter billion daily active users. A quarter billion people on this planet, resolve it. It is, it, use it, it is the town square. And joining me exclusively out front is Don Lemon. So Don, um, you do this 90 minute long interview mm -hmm. with Musk. Uh, you sit down with him. This is the culmination. He had actively courted you to come on one of his tweets. Have you considered doing your show on this platform? Maybe worth a try, audience is much bigger. Mm -hmm. It had been public. Then you had uh, reached a deal. I'll talk about that later. Uh, then he texts. 24 hours after this 90 minute long interview, which is the first of your show launching, he says contract is canceled. What happened? Yeah. First of all, it's good to see you, Aaron. Thank you, you for too. having me on. Uh I feel like, guys, let me know how you feel about this, right? I feel like William said in the chat that he feels like this is staged. I feel like Don Lemon is milking this. I feel like he's using this to give himself more publicity, right? Because like I said before, if you receive the settlement that Don Lemon received from CNN and you have a lot of resources and you have a lot of connections in the media business, just like Mehdi Hassan, just like Tucker Carlson, why would you sign a contract to go work for someone else? You are now making yourself an employee to someone else again. Like it, it does not make any sense. And I do feel like now he's going to go on all these different shows to try to milk this situation. So don't get it twisted. This is about publicity for Don. You, that's a good question for Elon Musk. Quite frankly, what happened? I don't know. As I said in my statement, I felt really good about the interview. 
I said to him as we were doing the interview, and it was tense at moments, but you've been involved in tense interviews. Yep. I said to him, I think it's good that people see folks like you and I who have different worldviews come together and talk, as he says, uh, have free speech. Free speech is only important when someone you don't like, or I would say someone who doesn't have your same point of view, are someone is, if they're allowed to speak freely and to say their point of view. Apparently that doesn't matter to Elon Musk. It's just for maybe talking points for him or, or rhetoric because uh, it, it doesn't seem to matter when it's about him, questions about him from people like me. All right. So, But that was proven already multiple times before you decided to sign this contract on. That was proven. Let me tell you something that Don Lemon also has been doing. I'm going to tell you again, some people just love publicity, right? They like being in the spotlight. And I think Don Lemon is one of those people, you know, he's been in the spotlight for years. And I think after he was fired from CNN, it's just like, oh, what do I do now? I miss the spotlight, that kind of thing. Before he signed that contract with Elon Musk, he actually started making statements that politically he now identifies with people like Ben Shapiro. Now, why would he make that statement? because he wanted to get publicity, because he knew it would actually catch eyeballs. This guy who for years says he's a liberal and he's on CNN, now all of a sudden saying that he identifies politically with Ben Shapiro. This is all a part of his game. When you said that, I wanted to play some of the clips because some of them are illuminating. These are clips that, that you, you shared with us. Um, this is a part of the conversation with Musk where you ask him about hate speech. Here it is. <laughs> Hate speech on the platform is up. Do you believe that X and you have some responsibility to moderate hate speech on the platform? That you wouldn't have to answer these questions from reporters about the Great Replacement Theory as it relates I to I don't Democrats, have to answer these questions. The Great Replacement Theory as it relates to Jewish people. Do you think that? I don't have to answer questions from reporters. Don, the only reason I'm doing this interview is because you're on the X platform and you asked for it. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I would not do interview with this interview. So you don't think, you, do you think that you wouldn't get in trouble or you wouldn't be criticized for these things? I'm or criticized that constantly. Was... I could care less. Illuminating in so many ways. All right, I have two, I have two things. Pause for a second. So Elon Musk just told Don Lemon that the only reason he's doing the interview is because obviously Don Lemon signed that contract uh, with the X platform. Otherwise, he wouldn't do it. Elon Musk basically told Don Lemon to his face, I really do not care about this thing with you, man. Like you are nobody to me. Do you guys realize that's what Elon Musk is really saying? He's basically telling Don Lemon, you are nobody to me, man. I don't care if you've been on CNN for 10, 15 or 20 years. The only reason I'm doing this interview with you is because you basically you signed that contract with X and you asked to do the interview. Otherwise I would not entertain you. Ay, ay, ay. Things I want to ask you about that, Don. First, the great replacement theory. Right. As you bring it up, um, you know, he has tweeted uh, a tweet he shared, increasing illegals boost Dem voting power, causing them to recruit more. Mm -hmm. If Dems win President House and Senate, they'll grant citizenship to all legals and America will become a permanent one party deep socialist state. Mm -hmm. Right. He has gone there directly. Uh, how much does he stand by these ideas? Well, he didn't quite seem to understand that he did. Uh, originally, he did that with Jewish people, sort of a great replacement theory thing that he did with Jewish people. With, and he got in trouble and he had to go to Auschwitz and, and answer questions and, and apologize and go with Ben Shapiro. But pause. Did you guys just hear that? So notice how he's pointing out how Elon Musk got in trouble because Zionists came after him. And that's when he took that trip to Israel, et cetera. Right. So, again, Who's really controlling the X platform here? Um, he doesn't understand that that sort of rhetoric that he talks about, the Great Replacement Theory and, um, and a migrant invasion, that's what radicalized shooters use in their manifestos, those exact words. The people who go and shoot up people, whether they be Latino people who live in Texas or black people who are in a supermarket uh, in Buffalo or Jewish people who are who are worshiping, those people use the same rhetoric that they are tropes, that they're either racist for Latinos or black people or mm -hmm. for Jewish people. And I wanted to know if he had, if he felt any responsibility as someone who has the, one of the largest social media and information platforms in the world. Quarter billion people. A quarter billion people. I think it's 455 or 500 million users 
a week. And it doesn't seem that he feels that he has any responsibility with that because he seemed really averse to facts. Pause for a second. So let me get this straight, Don. You wanted to sign the contract with the with the, the X platform because Elon Musk bragged about, about being in support of free speech and anti-censorship. So that's one of the things that really pulled you over to, you know, do the show on X. And now you're complaining because Elon Musk is saying something that you disagree with or that you find offensive and you don't think he should say it. But you went to the platform because Elon Musk preached about free speech. I may not agree with some of the things that Elon Musk says. I don't agree with some of the things that Don Lemon says, but I believe people have the freedom to say it. Right. So you don't have to like his tweet. You ain't got to retweet his tweet, et cetera. But it's just really ironic to me because what did you think he meant when he said people should have free speech and have the freedom to say what they want to say? What did you think that implied, Don? <laughs> you think that meant that he was going to police himself, that he was going to censor himself when he owns the platform? Here's another clip. You talked about ketamine in this particular mm -hmm. instance, something that he has uh, discussed before. Here he is. You talk about your ketamine use and, and depression. Have you, you also have said... And the, the reason I, sh I should say, like, the, like, the reason I mentioned... Uh, the, uh, the Academy of Prescription on the X platform was because I thought maybe this is something that could help other people. Mm -hmm. That's why I mentioned it. You know, obviously, I'm not a doctor, but I would say uh, if someone has depression issues, they should consider talking to their doctor about ketamine instead of SSRIs. Yeah. Very civil conversation, but yeah. that is where it got very personal. Well, it got personal, but I didn't put that out there. He has spoken very freely about his use of those are prescription drugs but about his use of ketamine i would not have brought it up if well, it was, on if x it, he posted it he posted it yeah and so i would not have brought it up because that's someone's personal information so i asked him about it also it it's no secret his drug use or alleged drug use i should say has been extensively written about it by very credible news organizations like the wall street journal and i asked him that and he said listen i have not read the wall street journal i don't read the wall street journal if i i don't have time to uh read about everything that people write about me i would never get anything done but also we, we remember on joe rogan he took a puff of marijuana right and he said oh god not a puff of weed why does this matter why is this important why are we don you never took a little smoky smoke you never took a little smoky smoke don come on don what about when you were in college you never went to a college party and took a little puff puff pass never once never i'm pretty sure if i were to look back into don's past there was some smoky smoke happening at some point i mean come on who cares this is the same guy that would go to parties and get flat ass wasted drunk, right? Isn't Don Lemon the same guy that had two different guys accuse him of sexual assault while he was drunk and intoxicated? I'd be willing to tell you alcohol can be more dangerous than weed. At least when people do a puff puff, they mellow out. <laughs> so it's like, for me, I just, <laughs> who cares? Who cares? He went on the Joe Rogan show and he took a smoke, a, a puff of marijuana. A lot of people got high on Joe Rogan's show. Who cares? Are we really going there? I thought we're supposed to be moving towards like legalizing marijuana all across this country, not trying to shame people for using it. Publicity dawn. It was just right. a joke and I only took one puff. Elon Musk is responsible for satellites, for Starlink. He's responsible for Tesla. He's responsible for a number of different companies on the, in the, uh, the stock market. Yep. And um, I, I think that it is important for people to understand his mindset, whether he's using drugs legally or not, and even, even if the ones he, that he's well, using, he's that's supposed to be- one of the most powerful people but, on the planet. But that's what he's one of, but-, but 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 nothing, because what is Don Lemon saying? Is he saying that people can't like smoke weed and be functional? Is he serious? <laughs> 
You know how many people, especially like when I waited tables, you know how many waiters, oh, I probably shouldn't tell you guys this, too late. You know how many waiters and bartenders would like smoke in their car before they went inside to clock in and serve you food? You know how many? You know how many would do a little puff puff pass on their little break when it was time to do the trash run, they would sneak out back and just do a little smoky smoke and go back inside, wash their hands and continue serving you. Is it just, wasn't there a movie like this, like back in the day, Reefer Madness. There was a movie about this back in the day that basically made it seem like if people like smoked weed, then it, it would make them crazy and they would do all these insane things. Are we serious? Like, listen, and I'm sure Dawn knows this. There are a lot of people in, especially in professional jobs, you'd be surprised who use uncontrolled substances and go to work every day like nothing happened and you'd never know. You'd be surprised. So I don't like what Dawn is doing here because I feel like it's just the anti weed is the devil drug propaganda. I don't like it. Ones that he's supposed to be that he is using prescription wise that, that he's following the a doctor's orders under that. Mm. But yes, he's one of the most consequential people to the planet. And that was one reason why I was attracted to in this conversation, you did talk about Trump. And again, given his role, he's one of the most powerful people in the world, running X, who he is going to support, whether he donates, the meeting that he took at Mar-a-Lago is of huge consequence mm -hmm. in the context of everything that he tweets. And here's part of the conversation you had with him about Trump. You recently met with Donald Trump in Florida. What did you guys talk about? I was at a breakfast at a friend's place and Donald Trump came by. That's it. What did you discuss? I'm, I don't, um, let's just say I, I, he did most of the talking. Did he ask you for money? He didn't. Are you going to loan him money to help pay his legal bills? I'm not, I'm not paying, paying his legal bills in any way, shape or form. Did he ask you for a donation? No. Are you First of all, let's go back for a little bit. But first of all, what's the deal with the lack of open ended questions? Like when I majored in broadcast journalism, we were taught to ask as many open-ended questions as possible. He just asked him three questions in a row that were closed ended questions, right? So these are questions that you can reply simply yes or no to. You're supposed to try to avoid those questions. It also comes across as like some type of interrogation because it can make the person that you're interviewing feel like they're on trial and not like they are having a conversation uh, during an interview. So it almost feels like he's on trial. It's just weird. What'd you discuss? I, I don't. Um, let's just say I, I, he did most of the talking. Did he ask you for money? He didn't. Are you going to loan him money to help pay his legal bills? I'm not. I'm not paying paying his legal bills in any way, shape, or form. Did he ask you for a donation? No. Are you leaning towards anyone? No. You're not leaning towards anyone because you've been. Very well, I'm leaning leaning away from Biden. You're leaning. <laughs> Uh, the trademark laugh there, yeah. which, by the way, in the context of the contract is canceled 24 hours after that interview, it just shows there was a lot of, of, of back and forth and, and give and take. There wouldn't have been as much back and forth and give and take if you would have asked him open ended questions and not those closed ones. Uh, Lance says, what kind of journalism is this? That's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, what did you take away from his comments on politics? Well, he says he's not going to endorse anyone now, but he may do it later. He says he's not going to give money to anyone now, but he may do it later. You never know with him. He may you know, be endorsing someone now on, on the platform. But um, you know, what's interesting to me in, in all of that and all these questions that you know about what people are asking me, what I asked Elon, uh, what happened, what did I do? Yep. During the course of that interview, I never, I never raised my voice. I told him, you know, I think this is important for people to hear, especially considering how the type of discourse that we're having in the country right now. And he supposedly says this is a public square for all. Maybe we're learning that a public square should not be privately owned by someone who doesn't think that there should be any moderation on that platform. 
Didn't you actually push against that, Don Lemon, when people brought this up before that sites like Twitter and Facebook should actually be uh, public, a public utility, and that those of us that actually are on those platforms should receive some type of compensation because those platforms actually use our data? Didn't you argue and push back against that, uh, especially during like that Bern the Bernie Sanders movement? I, this is really interesting to me because like. Honestly, first of all, let me say something, and I'm not here to defend Elon, but Elon can support whoever he wants for president. And if he wants to donate to a certain politician, he can donate to whoever he wants to. We have no control over that. And it's just, it, Elon tells you he's not leaning towards Joe Biden. So what? A lot of people are not leaning towards Joe Biden. He may not vote at all. He may not endorse anyone, but that's his decision to make. It's very strange. It's almost like he wanted to interrogate Elon because he feels like the platform is not being favorable towards the Democratic Party. So uh, it, it was interesting because at the end, I could tell that he was upset and he was uncomfortable. It was tense. And I said, listen, I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, I would go and have a beer and, and, and hash these things out. You and I do not disagree. You and I do not agree on much, yeah. but I will fight for your right as to be able to say what you want to say. That's what freedom of speech means to me. And 20. And you do that by trying to call out him smoking weed. Like it just, so look, let me peep this game. Okay. So Don Lemon now has a YouTube channel. Like Don Lemon could have done this the same way that Mehdi Hassan did and Tucker Carlson did and started his own network. He did not have to go work for Elon Musk. And it almost makes me wonder if this was like some type of plant uh, or scheme from the Democratic Party to try to get someone like Don Lemon in there so he can see and poke around and see what's happening on Twitter in reference to this election coming up in November. That's what it almost seems like to me if I had to make some guess. Oh, and of course, publicity for Don. I don't feel sorry for Don. <laughs> I do not feel sorry for you, bud. You had other options and opportunities that you could have pursued that most of us will never receive. Ay, 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 ay. Let's go to some of the comments uh, here. Shout out to uh, Dr. Nick for being a member for one month. Let's give Dr. Nick a big whoop, whoop. Thank you for the super chat, New York. Musk is a First Amendment absolutist, but free speech on its own, question mark. That is a double-edged sword. Uh, excuse me, word. I said sword. Double-edged word. Why is this hard for people to get? Thank you, P. Smith. Rogan, Lex Friedman, and others have interviewed Elon. Hours of interviews that weren't gotcha, typical CNN smear. Yeah, almost seemed like he was doing that for the Democratic Party. Thank you, New York. No more feelings for weasels with collapsible vertebrae. This is insane. Taibi got axed and no one said anything except Sabs and Door. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, what did you expect, Don? <laughs> Matt Taibi was very clear about what was happening. Thank you, R. Bailey. When you live in an elitist bubble like Don, you forget that when you work for an elitist, you are not equal to the boss. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. Thank you, New York. RE yesterday, Shapiro failed to mention that Israel has the same retirement age, 67, and we pay for it. Him and Lemon, Weasel University. Thank you, Jay. Oh, no, not a puff of weed. Let me find my pearls so I can clutch them. <laughs> and thank you, R. Bailey. We just savor the most prescription drugs. Thank you for that. And thank you for the super... Oh, thank you for gifting five savvy uh, memberships, Cooper. Thank you so much. Let's give Cooper a big shout out in the chizza. Woo. Okay. We're moving on to our next story here, and that is about RFK Jr. So some big news has actually been announced about RFK Jr.'s campaign. And that is that it seems like he has narrowed down who he is considering to be his running mate. And those choices are now Aaron Rodgers, quarterback Aaron Rodgers, 
and Jesse the Body Ventura. Let's get into this clip here from NBC News. And I want to tell you what I think about these picks. Juan Hilliard, one of the things that could take a bite out of the number of voters going for either President Trump or, or excuse me, President Biden or former President Trump, uh, depending on sort of how you see it, is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And I think about this because I think that the reporting has suggested that perhaps uh, an RFK campaign could be more damaging to Donald Trump than Joe Biden. I don't know if that's the conventional wisdom, but it seems as from some of the focus groups that have been out there, that is that is where things are from some of the polling as well. And now we have a sense of the veep stakes for him, right? And it is from MVP to VP, maybe Aaron Rodgers, what? Uh, Hallie, what? Uh, Aaron Rodgers took four snaps last year. Maybe uh, politics may be a better option for him going forward here. But he let's, wants to play next season. Frank. He wants right? to play next season. And who says that you can't run for president of the United States or vice president of the United States there where you're also no playing law. on the football you field? You are right. There and is no a, law to prevent that. And you got a pretty good fan base tuning in for those games. That's kind of free campaign advertising, if you will. Look, Aaron Rodgers is the vice presidential pick. It says a lot about the state of our politics here today. But of explain course, that. How did this even get into the conversation like what is happening well number one all right let me explain this part so for people wondering why would he why would he even consider uh quarterback uh aaron Rodgers? well remember aaron Rodgers actually got a lot of heat from the nfl uh during the pandemic remember he was very skeptical about the jab and he had disagreements in reference to mandates so when it comes to that particular issue him and RFK Jr. do have agreement there. So I'm wondering, that's probably the reason why he decided or he's considering uh, Aaron Rodgers. Also, Aaron Rodgers has been very vocal on a number of issues. I don't know if everyone remembers this because I'm going to show you a smear piece that CNN just did about Aaron Rodgers after this was announced. Uh, Aaron Rodgers actually was one of the NFL players that stood in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. I don't know if everyone remembers, but he had interviews about this. He also was one of the soldiers that are soldiers, one of the, the, the football players uh, that that was willing to say, no, we need to stand you know, with our, you know, comrades here, et cetera, even though fans were actually booing him at Green Bay. I'll never forget that uh, Aaron Rodgers was the one that said we need to stand in solidarity with the BLM movement. And they came out onto the field and they decided to lock arms and the, the fans in the stadiums were actually booing. Uh, their own team because they decided to do that. So it's not just the pandemic that he was vocal about. He was also very vocal uh, and stood in solidarity with the BLM movement. One RFK Jr., the former Democrat turned independent last year. He wanted to run for president of the United States as an independent. And on the ballot in a good number of states, you've got to uh, make an announcement about who your running mate is going to be. And so there's a time clock. It was a month ago that he told me he was going to make his announcement within the month. He bypassed that own self-imposed deadline. And there are serious question marks of who he would select. And frankly, it's not like you've been seeing folks uh, eagerly run and raise their arms saying uh, we are supporting. Kennedy for president or want to be his VP. The other individual who is up for consideration, according to Kennedy, is Jesse Ventura, the former Minnesota governor. And so for this ticket, I mean, there's the chance of spoiling it for Donald Trump or Joe Biden. And a lot of that is going to evolve. You know, I was at just uh, at a Kennedy event a couple weeks ago, and I was talking to folks that were there. There were some folks that told me they would otherwise vote for Joe Biden, a good number that told me they would vote for Donald Trump if Kennedy was in the race, and then others that said they wouldn't vote at all. He has sort of this weird, uh, uh, complex group of folks, most who are anti-vax or anti-COVID uh, uh, restrictions, but others, you know, the, he kind of has the message of anti-corporations, anti-big oil, uh, you know, pro-environment, more democratic type policies. So uh, it's a kind of a weird mix of folks that come from really both sides of the political spectrum, Allie. See, notice he didn't mention what I mentioned to you, which is the other things about Aaron Rodgers that he's also stood for. Notice they mentioned the anti-jab thing, right? So it's interesting with Jesse Ventura, though, because I, I say this because Jesse Ventura is anti-war. We all have seen, and I've covered this before, about 
RFK Jr.'s stance uh, in reference to Israel. This is why I've said a number of times, RFK Jr. is not my candidate. I can't vote for anyone who is on that pro-Israel train. And I also can't vote for someone that puts out a statement that says we need to give Israel the weapons and things that they need. So if you remember when that happened, RFK Jr. actually received a lot of criticism from some of his supporters who said you were supposed to be the peace candidate. That's what you said when you were running. And now here you are saying we need to give Israel these weapons and give them everything that they want. So the mask was off with RFK at that point where people realized, no, he's not anti-war. Jesse Ventura is, though. So it could just be that Jesse Ventura is maybe willing, I don't, we don't know yet, but maybe willing to uh, work with RFK because RFK is running as an independent, or maybe he agrees with RFK Jr. on some of these other issues. Uh, last time Jer uh, Jesse Ventura was on this show, he did say he was in support of Andrew Yang's forward party, uh, but since then has broken away from, I guess, being a part of a third party and said that people should run as independents. When he was governor of Minnesota, remember, he did not run through the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. And the reason he said on this show why he was able to win is because he was on the debate stage. So Jesse Ventura is a good debater. I do want to mention that. So that's important for people to know. And he's been very, you know, a strong advocate about people running outside of the duopoly. So there's that. Some people may ask, why didn't he choose to align himself with uh, Jill Stein and the Green Party or with Cornell West or with Claudia De La Cruz? Uh, Jesse Ventura already had his experience with the Green Party. And I asked him on my show, why not help out the Green Party? And he said, because they're a mess, Sabrina. <laughs> That's what he told me. He said, they're a mess. So I can see why he would decide to stay away from that. Uh, in reference to Claudia Day Cruz, she's running through PSL and maybe he feels like she's not going to have enough ballot access. So why entertain that? Uh, Party for Socialism and Liberation and Jesse Ventura does not identify as a socialist, right? So then that leaves Cornell West and then also a similar thing. I don't think they agree on most of the policies on Dr. West's platform. So the next person he would probably be the closest in reference to or closely aligned to in reference to policy probably would be RFK Jr., you know, minus the, the, the war issue there. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's interesting. Von Hilliard, thank you for being across all of it tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. OK, now I want to get to this piece here because there's more about this. Uh, you know, as I told you, they are already starting to smear Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers has not said yes. <laughs> no, anything. He has not been confirmed. But here come the smears about Aaron Rodgers. And this was from CNN. This was announced immediately after he was considered as one of the prospects. In 2013, when CNN's Pamela Brown was covering the Kentucky Derby, she was introduced to Rodgers. Hearing that she was a journalist at CNN, Rodgers began attacking the news media for, quote, covering up important stories. Rodgers then brought up the Sandy Hook shooting and said the news media was intentionally ignoring that the shooting wasn't real, that it was a government inside job. I remind you the shooting, of course, was very real, very tragic. 20 children and six adults were murdered that day. When Pamela Brown asked Aaron Rodgers for evidence of what he was talking about, Rodgers then began sharing various theories that have been disproven numerous times by evidence. Rogers falsely claimed to Pamela Brown that there were men in black in the woods by the school, and he asked if she thought that was odd. Brown says that she found the entire encounter disturbing. So you see what's happening? So they're trying to smear uh, Aaron Rodgers there. They're trying to say that he was a part of or one of the people that bought into the whole Sandy, you know, hook conspiracy thing. So they're trying to use that against him. One sec. Sorry. I had to sneeze. Um, 
They're trying to use that against him. Uh, there's going to be more of this as we get closer to November. You guys, this isn't over. Uh, you know, my thing is if you're going to criticize RFK jr, criticize him based on his stance on Israel, right? If you're going to come after him in reference to that, that's what I criticized him on. The other thing I criticized him on was flip flopping on police reform. You know, he said one thing and then he flipped to something else. And I don't think that like his plan that he has on his website, his racial, you know, equality plan that some people have referred to as reparations, that's actually not reparations. And I think he's asking for the bare minimum in reference to minimum wage. We're past uh, $15 minimum wage. It needs to be way more than that at this point. Uh, but that being said, I just feel like the smears are starting to come because they know that RFK Jr. is a threat, uh, especially according to the polls. I already showed you guys the polling in Arizona. The fact that RFK Jr. and uh, the poll I showed you, I think it was like two weeks ago, has 22% support in Arizona and Trump and Biden are tied at like 34% in Arizona. He is going to be a factor in a state like Arizona, in a state like Georgia, which Joe Biden actually won in 2020. I don't think Joe Biden's going to win Arizona and Georgia this time around, but we'll have to you know, wait and see for all of that. So they do consider him to be a threat. And Jesse Ventura actually had announced this uh, in February this year. I support all third party and independent candidates running for U.S. president this year. From Cornell West to Dr. Jill Stein to RFK Jr. and everyone else not running under the Democrat and Republican Party banner. We must end the duopoly of Republican and Democrat control in Washington. Electing a third party or independent candidate for president would be a major kickstart to that process. But in order to do that, you have to have ballot access. That is why this Monday, February 5th at the Fox Theater in Tucson, Tucson, Arizona, I'll be introducing RFK Jr. at a voter rally to get him on the ballot. Find out the details here. So he posted this February 3rd of 2024. So again, like I said, uh, Jesse Ventura, he's consistent when it comes to working outside the duopoly. He's not one of those people that's going to come to you and say, well, you just got to vote for Joe Biden. Like he stands by that. Right. And he won. He won as a candidate that ran outside of the duopoly. Now he actually had uh, a speech here when he talked about his support uh, for RFK Jr. And I want you to hear this speech from Jesse. Uh, I'm here in support of Robert F. Kennedy's bid for president of the United States. And I support this because I have been a person of the third party my entire political career and my entire adult lifetime. I go way back. I voted for John Anderson back in 1980 for those of you that are old enough to remember that. So I have been a third party person all this, my entire life. I support the third party movement. Ralph Nader had it best when he called it the two party dictatorship because that's what it is. And it's really interesting now too, considering Ralph Nader and I, I don't know what's going on with Ralph Nader because he's been seen uh, making quotes saying he would do whatever he could to help Joe Biden. Now he denied making that statement on his interview with Bree on bad faith podcast, but that is what they printed <laughs> in the interview that he had. I believe that was with the Washington post. So Ralph Nader scares me a little bit because he's always been preaching against the duopoly but I feel like he also has a little bit of Trump derangement syndrome where he feels like in the end, you're going to have to go with Joe Biden. So we don't get Donald Trump again. I think some people are just deathly afraid of Donald Trump. And for me, I'm like, we've had both. We've had Trump and we've had Joe Biden. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I just feel we need to move outside of the duopoly. So you're seeing a pro you're seeing right now, right now, the very reason we need to elect somebody other than Democrats or Republicans. And that reason is this. You're seeing it right now with this border bill where they put their party before the country. 
So yeah, that was the speech that he gave uh, at a, a Kennedy uh, event. And I think that, you know, what's really interesting when I think about like Jesse Ventura, Jesse Ventura, he's a great speaker. Uh, again, he has the experience. He has been governor of Minnesota and he has also had the experience of running outside of the duopoly. He's been on the debate stage. He knows what it takes to get onto the debate stage. I think if, if RFK Jr. is going to choose between the two, I think the better option would be Jesse Ventura. Plus, Aaron Rodgers said he still wants to play football this year. So I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how Aaron Rodgers is going to play football, you know, and still <laughs> try to like uh like be vice president or something like that. Because Aaron Rodgers is what's he gonna do? Make calls from the field and be like, and vice president quarterback Aaron Rodgers. Hold on, I gotta take a call, you know. It's a lot like and that that schedule is is pretty draining like during football season. But uh, I also just think like Jesse has more experience, so I could probably see him choosing him instead of Aaron Rodgers. You know, that being said, though, I've, I've said this time and time again, if RFK Jr. were to change his position on Israel and Gaza, he would also pull some of that support away from Joe Biden. Actually, he probably pull a lot of support away from Joe Biden uh, because you have you know, numbers of people out in the streets, a part of the pro-Palestinian marches. I participated in those marches and they really would just love, you know, I think someone who has a name as big as him and is actually pulling a lot of, or getting a lot of support right now to change on that position. But we know that's not going to happen, right? RFK Jr. has been questioned about this multiple times. Some of the statements he made on breaking points also said were very cringe. Uh, so it is what it is. He's not my candidate, but some people do still support him. And they said they're willing to, you know, overlook that or hopefully move him on that issue. I don't think he can be moved on that issue. And I also asked Dennis Kucinich about that when I interviewed him as well. I don't think it's going to happen. Now, he did have an interview recently on Fox News. And he's actually uh, challenging Joe Biden and Donald Trump to a debate. And if his percentage points actually continue to hold, that could be the case. You need 15 percent. You're on the debate stage. So let's get into this. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, witnessing a good deal of this. He gets back with the notion as an independent candidate for president of the United States that this is part of the problem. These guys, the two presidential candidates right now, repeat of the last rate are the problem. Kind enough to join us. Robert, good to see you. Good to see you again, Neil. Thanks for having me back. Same here. Let me ask you a little bit about what you made of this back and forth on Robert Hur and more particularly his issue. He didn't take a prosecutorial uh, issue with the president because of his age, because of his memory problems, significant memory problems. What did you think of that? Um, well, you know, I haven't read the transcripts, uh, but, you know, the, the issues that he pointed out that President Biden couldn't remember specific uh, things that you would think he'd remember um, when he was vice president under the dates when he was vice president under President Obama. I mean, uh, 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 under President Obama, the um, the date of his his son's death and a number of other things are worrying. Um, I think that it's it's important for President Biden to do what he did the other night, which is actually to come out in public, but more importantly, to have unscripted debates, uh, unscripted encounters with voters uh, to engage in the debate, which Americans expect from the presidential candidate. Pause here for a second. So he's speaking about uh, this testimony from special counsel, her about Joe Biden's mental acuity, right? So he's talking about this and he mentioned the debate that Americans expect a debate. There have been rumblings that Joe Biden is not going to debate Donald Trump. And I think that's BS. If that were to happen, I think he should have to debate. I think all of them should have to debate. It's, you know, that's a way for Joe Biden to kind of hide and run away from this, uh, his mental issues that he's having. Uh, and it would also it would scream to the American people that Joe Biden is not up for the job. So I think that he should debate Donald Trump. I don't care if both of the, the uh, both of them have been president already. That is not what this is about. 
You're supposed to debate. <laughs> You're supposed to talk about your plans for the country and let the American voters decide who they're going to choose or which way they want to go. But you don't rob the American people of having that type of choice. And I think it would be a mistake. I think it would be a disaster if the DNC told Joe Biden, you don't have to debate because both of you have already been president. That would be a disaster. And I don't think the American people would go for that. I think people would actually hit the streets. I really do. And, um, you know, to show this is, a, this is a job, Neil, that requires a lot of nuance, of complexity of mind, of acuity, mental acuity. And we, want to, we, we have a right to, uh, to assurances that the person who's in charge of, of taking that phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning when all of our children's lives are at stake, that they're going to make good judgments and the best decisions and that they're going to be, you know, they're going to be on their toes. So I think it's important for him to persuade the American public, to show the American public he can do that, particularly after these kind of questions have been officially raised, you know, not only by the prosecutor, but also the, you know, the mainstream media is now talking about some of these issues. Yeah, whether he's too old for the job. Now, you had said, and a lot of people who like the president said that he brought his A-game to a State of the Union address. You did not agree. You you had said that, that it was a hyper-partisan uh, speech. You're, you're similarly not a huge fan of Donald Trump's, uh, uh, and it looks like those two guys are not keen on, on, on debating each other it might happen but it doesn't look like it will what do you think of all of that well i think we're living at a time when the two least popular mainstream or um, uh, uh, mainstream party candidates in the history of our country are running both of them would actually win the prize for the least popular candidate in the history of a major political party Oh, 80 percent of the public says that they don't want the a rematch of 2016. They want other choices. Um, and, you know, now it's a three man race. As of today, I think both candidates will clinch their party's nomination in the, in the three primaries that are being held today. And it will be and will be entering the general election. And I would hope that both of these candidates will debate. and We should start talking about the issues that concern Americans, the chronic disease epidemic, the destruction of our soils, the forever wars. We do have to get in on that debate. You have to get in on that debate. So this shouldn't even be an issue, uh, especially considering it is the Democratic Party right now that's making, continuing to say we have to protect our democracy. But this, it shouldn't even be a possibility that there isn't going to be a debate. There's just no way. There's just just absolutely no way. And I, I think people want to see a debate, right? So I just, I feel like it just makes, it shows the American people just how flawed our electoral system is. And not just flawed, but how it's rigged. So you can't get upset when people complain and say it's all rigged and you're doing the things you're doing right now. If RFK Jr. can hold on to at least 15%, he would be on the debate stage. If they have debates, if they don't have debates, he won't be on the debate stage. Same thing with Jill Stein. Same thing with Claudia De La Cruz. So this could be a way, pay attention folks, because this could be a way that the DNC chooses to basically hide the third party and independent candidates, especially if any of them get to that 15%. They'll just say, nope, we're not having any debates. We don't want them on the world stage. Now, what's interesting is that RFK Jr. is saying that he wants to debate Biden and Trump, but he was not present at the third party independent debate that I covered on this show. There were the two libertarian candidates. There was Jill Stein, Claudia De La Cruz, and Jasmine Sherman. RFK Jr. and Cornell West were not present at the third party independent debate, and they were invited. According to uh, the Freedom, the Free and Equal organization that actually hosted that debate, they said they invited all of them. All of them were invited. So if RFK Jr., you want to debate, why didn't you debate at that third party and independent debate? I know it's not Joe Biden and Donald Trump, but still. It's interesting. Independent candidate, you've gotten on a few more states now. Last time I checked, 
New Hampshire, Utah, Hawaii, Nevada, very close to Georgia. I, I could go on and, and look at South Carolina, uh, Alabama. I, I, but you need to get on a lot more state ballots. And there's been talk that you're, you're going to become a libertarian. Uh, they're interested in you. Any truth to that? That, they're, that could get you on pretty much all of them. Yeah, we will be on all the state ballots. And we're, we've now launched... Today, actually, we're starting launching a, a push to get us on all the ballots that are open today at this point within four to six weeks. And as they open, we will we, we will have four to six weeks to get on each one and we will make those deadlines. All right. When you say you make those deadlines and you would be more than a, a spoiler, right? If you're on all the state ballots, you have a real crack at it and, and, and more than just getting a, a spoiler role. But the, the, the traditional wisdom is you hurt uh, President Biden more than you hurt Donald Trump. What do you say? That's not what I've seen. That's not what I've seen in the, in the numbers. It appears he seems to be, I have to look at a new poll, double check, but it seems like he's actually pulling more away from Donald Trump than Joe Biden. Like I said, I'll have to go back and check and see if there's a new, a newer poll that I missed somewhere. Um, but we have to stop, you know, when, when people call you a spoiler, you have to push back on that. Like people have to, we have to get away from that rhetoric. These people aren't spoilers. These people are candidates. You don't have to like them. You ain't got to vote for them. You ain't got to agree with them. But these people are not spoilers. That's what a democracy is about. Free and, and what, fair elections? To say that someone is a spoiler because they're not running as a Republican or they're not running as a Democrat, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, my intention is to hurt both of them. You know, I'm getting, right now I'm beating both candidates and independent voters. And independents are the biggest part. This is the first net uh, election in history, Neil, where independents are the biggest voting bloc. So independents now represent 43% of American voters, self-identified independents. Republicans are only 27, Democrats are only 27, and I'm beating both candidates in independents. I'm also beating them and by really dramatic margins, by 40% uh, among uh, Americans who are under 35 in the battleground states, I'm beating them under, among Americans under 45. So those are, I'm, I'm tied in a three-way tie for Hispanic votes, and that vote is increasing for me. Um, I'm, I'm really winning in all of the major demographics, except with one exception, which is baby boomers. And we believe that we're going to start making inroads with them soon. So I, I really, I think we have a very good chance of, of winning in November. That very interesting there. LPA Film says, I was about to say independent voters are heavily leaning towards RFK. Yeah, there's that as well. And another one I think that was not mentioned, he's increasing among uh, Hispanic voters. He's also increasing among African-American voters. He has 13%, last poll I saw, 13% support from African-American voters. Uh, same thing with Cornell West. They were in the same that same poll, 13% uh, African-American voters. Donald Trump, 15%. From African American voters, he has increased his support. These are all the people that these people pulled away, you know, uh, from Joe Biden, pulled away from the Democratic Party. So it is really interesting. And I keep telling people, I've said this multiple times if I was Joe Biden and Donald Trump and any of these candidates that are running against RFK, they really need to be coming after RFK. I know they feel like he's not a threat or they feel like it's not going to matter because they think he's not going to be on these ballots. But I heavily disagree based on what I've seen. And I think that they should actually consider him to be a real contender. Now, I don't agree with his, his policies. I'm not voting for him, but the writing is on the wall. And all this time, Joe Biden more so has been avoiding RFK Jr. I, 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 but he is now, seems like he's choosing between Jesse Ventura and Aaron Rodgers. Very interesting. Also, popular people. Notice both of those options, they're popular people, right? Let's go to some of the comments here. Uh, Frank says, damn, I love Ventura, but RFK Jr. is a piece of crap. 
Leon says RFK Jr. is pro increasing police funding. Yes, he is. And I covered that. Amanda says, I just saw a title by Kim Iverson or thumbnail that also included Arnold Schwarzenegger. Interesting. Arnold Schwarzenegger. But see, the problem with Arnold Schwarzenegger is he can't be president. He talked about this before. So he can't be. So if something were to happen to the president and he's the vice president, he can't step in because he wasn't born here. So he has that same the same issue that Jenk uh, has as well. We'll get into that. Thank you for the super chat in New York. Ventura ran as an independent one and had a surplus three of his four years. A vet slash Navy SEAL, anti-war, free speech, anti-party, NPP, a real one. Thank you, B-Man. The only candidate against aiding Israel is Jill Stein. Also, way back when Ron Paul called Israel an apartheid state. Yeah, Case Study QB actually uh, had talked to me about that recently. Uh, Ilhaner says, Tucson. Ah, Tucson is how you say it, Sabby. I don't know. Yeah. I, I've never been there. <laughs> Thank you, the peace. Uh, I have been doing some research and found out how much high ranking uh, Zionist people have shaped our laws since World War II and the Middle East, even in Congress, shaping the war in Gaza, follow the money. We've talked about, we continue to talk about how Zionism has a strong, you know, hold uh, in the world, not just in reference to electoral politics in the United States. Uh, thank you, B-Man. Jesse just lost me. He's angry because border bill wasn't passed. Bill was just money for Ukraine and Israel. Yeah, they bundled that together. They bundled that together. This is why we need single subject bills. Uh, Boogie Boogie Barnes hit the streets and 45 still going to turn into 47. Sabby, what do you think about Rashida Tlaib running third party like Brianna suggested yesterday to Jenk? I think it needs to be someone who's not already in Congress uh, because they've already been corrupted in some way, shape or form. Uh, Rashida Tlaib, yes, she's been very vocal in reference to the Palestinian people and she's spoken out, you know, about her people. I will give her that. She spoke out against the railroad, uh, the railroad workers not being allowed to go on strike and she voted in support of the railroad workers. I'll give her that. Uh, but I think it needs to be someone who's not already in that DC bubble. Uh, thank you for the super chat, R. Bailey. Biden's age should not be in question. His mental condition should be well said. And thank you, Janine. RFK didn't go on that debate to make sure his supporters didn't see the other candidates. He knows they are better than him. Interesting, Janine. Interesting point. If you have not had a chance to do so, go ahead and smash that like button, guys. If you are new, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. We're moving on to our next story. I'm not sure if everybody remembers Fat Joe, but Fat Joe, he's a rapper. He also used to uh, perform with Big Pun. This was like back in the day and then Big Pun passed away, but Fat Joe's still around. So Fat Joe has now become a part of uh, the Democratic Party's hip hop entertainment arm. And we've talked about this before on the show where they have basically prompt up and, and promoted people like Charlemagne the God from The Breakfast Club. Uh, they're getting people from hip hop radio or hip hop artists to basically get the message out to the African-American community to come out and to continue to support Joe Biden. This is how desperate they are now. They have to go to rappers and hip hop radio shows, right? Now they've gone to Fat Joe. And not only did they go to Fat Joe, but Fat Joe actually came to the White House and he met with Joe Biden. Shout out to Case Study QB for this clip. Fat Joe discusses his advocacy for a transparent health care system while praising Joe Biden. So let's get into this, folks. Joe, you have been an enormous advocate for a transparent health care system. I mean, you even released a PSA with, with Rick Ross, with Buster Rhymes, others. Listen to what you have to say. I want everyone to see this. We love our nurses and we need our doctors. But hospitals and insurers rigging a system to make profits off of people that's in struggle is unforgivable. We demand prices and transparency in health care. How? To the patients. Now, let me tell you why that's weak. If you 
it's one thing to demand transparency in healthcare. It's another thing to say everybody needs to have healthcare in this country. So it's weak. It's a weak ask, right? And I've always told you when you're demanding something, you always ask for more than what you actually want because they're usually going to give you less than what you ask for. So to me, if Fat Joe was serious about everybody in New York getting some type of access to quality health care or actually having health care, where was Fat Joe when it came down to the New York Health Care Act, right? The New York State Health Care Act was on the table at one point. Didn't hear about that from Fat Joe then. Also, you got to meet with Joe Biden, et cetera. Why didn't you push for some type of universal health care? Our country has the money to pay for it. They got $3.8 billion that goes to Israel. Everyone in Israel has health care. They got billions of dollars that goes to Ukraine. The money is not being spent in the right way. So this is a weak ask from Fat Joe. First of all, you got the best beard of everyone we just saw. I'm just saying for a second there. Don't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you, know, you see it. You see it. I see it. But you have been passionate about this. I'm wondering, given that, are you optimistic coming out of the address last night that at least that portion will be met? Well, I know that's what I was doing there. Going for health care transparency. Over 100 million Americans are in debt due to uh, hospital uh, prices. And so I was over there and I was mingling with everybody. So, I, you know, I'm a diehard Democrat, but I stuck in the speaker's gala first because I had pause. So everyone caught that, right? He's a diehard Democrat and he's a celebrity. And that's why he was allowed to come there. That's why he was allowed to have access to them because he's a diehard Democrat. If he was there to criticize Joe Biden or Biden's policies, he would not have been there. to deal with the republicans i'm i'm trying to bring this law through bipartisan mm -hmm. so i went up in there stuck in. he saw me he said fat joe he told his wife yo i got street cred fat joe came to check me then they had an incredible spread of food and in true uh <laughs> fashion i was the first to eat the food there and then i talked to everybody about health care transparency on the republican side then I went to see Hakeem Jeffries, mm -hmm. hung out over there, saw their spread up too. So listen to what's happening here, folks. So he went to go talk to Hakeem Jeffries. Do you get to talk to Hakeem Jeffries? Those of you who live in Hakeem Jeffries district, do you get to go talk to him? No, but the celebrities do. You see how people like Fat Joe and Charlemagne the God and how they can just go walk in Matthew McConaughey and just sit down with politicians and talk to them. Everyone should have that opportunity. You shouldn't have to be a celebrity or professional athlete to talk to your representatives. They don't talk to us. They run away from us. When we have questions for them, they see us and they run away or they try to dox us like they've done to people like Jose Vega. Do you see how that works? You know, and just hung out with everybody over there and just bringing awareness that America is in a big crisis. You know, a lot of people are losing their homes, losing everything they got due to health care prices. And so that's why I was in there. But now the atmosphere, Lord, this was the Super Bowl of politics. Mm -hmm. So standing room only, I'm upper deck, too. I didn't have like a front row. I'm usually courtside at a Nick game. I'm upper deck. <laughs> I don't feel too bad because the governor, Kathleen Holcomb from, from New York, was sitting next to me. So we both was in the cheap seats, right? But we had the time of our lives, the president, vintage Joe Biden. I've been a fan for so many years since he was a senator. He was so sharp. That's another concern. He has been a fan of Joe Biden since Joe Biden was a senator. You want to talk about some of the things that Joe Biden did when he was a senator? We want to talk about the crime bill. Fat Joe, that's who you were a fan of? Because you see, Fat Joe, your music is not adding up. Your music is, is, is not adding up right now. Because the things that you rap about and you're rapping against certain things and you tell me that you've been a fan of Joe Biden since he was a senator, knowing the racist things that Joe Biden has said, knowing the segregationists that Joe Biden has worked with. 
knowing how his policies actually harmed the black community. And that's someone that you were a fan of. Fat Joe, your music is not aligning with your politics, boo. Because you see, they bring on people like Fat Joe. They get the celebrities to come on to try to convince their fans to support these politicians. Same reason why they bring on Charlemagne the God, because they know the Breakfast Club is probably one of the biggest radio stations in the country. So they know a lot of black people listen to the Breakfast Club. It's a hip hop radio show. So that's the goal to get the fans to believe that they should still support Joe Biden, even though Joe Biden and the Democratic Party is not actually helping the African-American community. He hit every point he had to hit. He was flawless. He was uh, comedic in a way. The whole thing's theater. So you got him making his points. You got the vice president, my girl, Kamala Harris. She's cheering him on. And then you got the speaker behind him making all kind of faces. A lot Man, of this faces. is theater. And what Fat Joe was doing is theater. You see? So he said, see that? He said, my girl, Kamala Harris. That'll be important when I show you what he's going to be doing with her. This was the all-star game of politics, and I was glad I had a seat in the house. Well, what about those who were in the crowd heckling? Were you surprised by that? What was your reaction when you saw and heard President Biden responding to calls from the audience? And the audience, of course, were members of Congress. It showed that he was sharp. It showed that this wasn't like a scripted thing, because mm. he was responding right back to them, to whatever they were saying he was responding. And um, that's... And that's because they gave him something. We all know Joe was hyped up on something. Come on. We all know this. So Fat Joe is here to convince his fans, the people who like his music, right? That Joe Biden actually is sharp. That he doesn't have a problem with his mental acuity. Just the state of politics now. You know, this ain't the back in the days. This is now where you got... You know, everybody screaming out, doing whatever, you know, uh, and that's just the state of politics. That's where we at right now. Twenty twenty four. Well, let me ask you, I mean, you said you met with Republicans and Democrats. I'm happy to hear that because obviously you have been so passionate. You know, the only path forward is the bipartisanship on an issue like that. When you spoke to Speaker Johnson, when you talked to Republicans, did you feel more than the fan love? Did your policies, did your proposals with those? Yeah, I resonated? mean, he told me he was. The speaker told me he was a health attorney before this and knows all about the issue. And Pause. You guys hear this? This is very revealing. So this is Fat Joe, and he met with uh, Mike Johnson here, okay, the new speaker of the House. So Fat Joe just told you that Mike Johnson basically knows all about the issue. Had a former health position. And it's not just Mike, all of them know about the issue. All of them know about the healthcare issue in this country, but they're paid not to give you healthcare. If you're taking money from big pharma, you're not gonna give people healthcare in this country. If you're taking money from the military industrial complex, you're probably not gonna give uh, healthcare to people in this country as well, because that's one of the benefits that people get when they join the, 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 the military. That's one of the recruitment benefits that they push towards them. You'll get TRICARE. TRICARE covers almost everything, which is true, it does. So if they were to give everybody healthcare, that would also decrease military recruitment even more. Same thing is why they don't want to give you free public universities, because that would also decrease recruitment for the military more. And military recruitment is already down. So there's that, too. He said he's all in. And so we love this uh, power to the patients and myself. We love this bill being presented by Bernie Sanders and Senator Brown, which is a bipartisan bill that forces the hospitals to show us the prices. Now, Joe, what's so important about the prices? Well, if you got to have an MRI, there's a such thing going on right now in the same hospital, they could charge four different, four different prices for four different patients in the same hospital at the same time. So now we want to know the prices so that we can do our research, look at three hospitals, and it builds competition and it helps. You see this? He's talking about healthcare from a capitalist perspective, building competition. Listen to this very carefully, what he's telling you. They're advocating for healthcare transparency. Yes, 
We should all have transparency. However, they're not arguing for you to be able to have these procedures for everyone to have health care in this country. So even if you know the prices ahead of time, which you should, that doesn't help you pay for it, especially if you don't have health insurance. Listen to how he's talking about it, though. That creates healthy competition among the hospitals. He basically just trying to advocate for capitalism in the healthcare system. He's not actually asking for something better than what we already have. This is not about a business. This is supposed to be about giving people health care. This is supposed to be about people being able to go into the hospital, have these procedures and walk away debt free the same way they can in countries like Germany, the same way they can in, well, this might be changing, but in, like in the UK, these things can be done. So you see how he turned this into a business proposition? So of course, Mike Johnson is going to tell you, yeah, I agree. I'm all in because it doesn't cost the government anything. the Americans. So I'm just spreading the word, talking to everybody, letting everybody know. They all know I'm a diehard Democrat, but they know wow. And then uh, I want to shout out to the Rep. Berrigan because she had never, she's a congresswoman for eight years, she had never been to the Speaker's Gala. So I convinced wow. her, I said, yo, we got to go. And so we started her, she was talking to everybody and we was talking to each other. It was a great event for me. For me, it was uh Amazing. And then I actually bumped into the president. What did he say to you? You, you know, I'm the Forrest Gump of hip hop, man. I'm everywhere <laughs> I need to be. You can't make this up. You can't make this up. I'm walking to all and here comes the president. He says, man, I, I mean, you want to know what he really told me? He said, yeah. thank you for being loyal. He said, thank you for being loyal. Mm. And then he hugged a uh, congresswoman. And uh, he shook my hand, and that was that was amazing to me because I had no clue the president was walking right towards me. Listen to what he said. He said Joe Biden told him, "Thank you for being loyal." Right? You know what that basically means in reference to politics, not criticizing him, being loyal. Fat Joe. You know that healthcare is a big issue in this country, and you know how people, are particularly in New York City, your city, need healthcare. Giving people transparency doesn't give them healthcare. If I see that there are three different hospital choices, and for let's say I need a knee replacement, God forbid, let's say I need a knee replacement, hospital A says it's going to be. $800. Hospital B says it's going to be $1,200. Hospital B says it's going to be $1,500. Okay. Why well, no hospital A is cheaper. It's $800. What does that matter if I can't pay for it? You went all up in there, fat Joe. I see you advocating for no, no increase in the minimum wage up in this mofo. I see you advocating for a living wage let alone health care for everyone. I had no clue. And it was, it, that was it. That was the, that, that was amazing. I walked out of there because, you know, they, they locked down the whole Washington, D.C. And I walked maybe 15, 20 blocks so happy just walking. I met the president. I had the time of my life. I had a great time. The American people were there. I mean, it was amazing. I'm going to tell you something. I think you are the only person in the world who could refer to you as Forrest Gump. So I'm going to let you do it, but I would never do it. I'm going to call you Fat Joe the Diplomat, as I'm going to call you from now on, because, wow, the, the, the ambassador in the hallways. I'm so glad that you came. You brought a big smile to my face. Thank you for the advocacy and, the, and what you're talking about for health care. Because I'll tell you, I remember a couple of years ago going to the hospital thinking I had like some sort of heart palpitations. And the bill I got caused a heart attack. Okay? I was like, yeah, but you got health insurance. Are you, are you joking? Are you, uh, really? It's are you kidding me right now with this? So I understand. Yeah. And for people who have been in various situations, the cost is obscene. So I'm glad to know that you are making some headway, at least in bipartisanship. Real quick, though, I, I know I got to go. They're telling me I got to get off with you, but I can't help mm -hmm. it. I got to ask you, you know, with this upcoming election, your enthusiasm, your charisma is something that 
people don't necessarily have for the upcoming election. How do you get people to be excited about participating in the elections and voting? You see what I mean, guys? This is what it was all about. Listen to this. I think they all. I think they're just keeping it to themselves. Mm. They're trying to act like they're not really motivated, but they're really motivated and, and they and they really know what they got to do. And so on both sides, I feel a big energy. You know, I got Trumpers here in Miami with me. They, they, they don't stop. And then I got the Democrats up in New York talking about, yo, Joe, we got to go all the way. And so everybody's really, really excited. And now it's crunch time because before it was the primaries. Now it's one on one. Let's go. Let's get the business. And Joe Biden came out swinging last night. I don't care what anybody says. I haven't seen Joe Biden like that in years. He was really, really sharp last night. When Fat Joe says people are motivated, he's talking about the people in his circle. In his elite celebrity bubble. Because I have spoken to people, working class people and poor people, and none of them have said that. Whether it's Biden or Trump or whoever, none of them have said that. Most people I've spoken to told me they are not participating at all. But this, 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 this fat Joe. So you see what they're doing? You see the game bringing out the celebrities to try to motivate their fan base to come out and vote. And look, we need to talk about access, right? So fat Joe was there and look at what's happening with him and Kamala Harris. Cause this is also another weak ask. Kamala Harris will host a marijuana reform event with fat Joe. So first of all, the hell do you mean reform? <laughs> what do you mean reform? It's legal in how many states now? Give me a break. You should have known it was over when once Virginia legalized it. What do you mean reform? Reform what? Let's get into this. This is Fat Joe and Kamala Harris. Vice President Kamala Harris will hold the administration's first public event on marijuana reform this week after President Biden addressed the issue as one of his priorities in last week's State of the Union address. Harris will convene a roundtable discussion in the West Wing featuring Grammy nominated artist Fat Joe, Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir, and individuals who received pardons for prior cannabis convictions. Why are you having this round table discussion with fat Joe? These celebrities get seats at the table that the constituents never get. Now they said they're going to have a couple of people who got pardons from prior convictions or whatever. What, what, what is this discussion about? Because you don't need to have a round table to figure this out. You legalize it across the nation. It's that simple. And actually, you don't need Congress to do that. President Biden can actually do that by executive order. Now, why will he not do that? Because that actually will hurt the police state. Make no mistake, Joe Biden wanted to give the police more money. And he did give him more money than Donald Trump did, right? So if you legalize it across the state, some of these cops are not going to have as much to do because I told you they don't really solve any crimes. 0.02%. We all know they're not preventing crime. They're going to be spending more time getting donuts. Harris' main portfolio includes reproductive health care, gun violence, and voting rights, but she has consistently amplified criminal justice reform since her years as district attorney in California. This is a jokety joke, joke, joke because she actually targeted people in California. She targeted people. She came after parents for their kids not going to school. She imprisoned parents because their kids didn't show up in school. And it just, the marijuana thing. Now all of a sudden she's supposed to be the right person in reference to marijuana. After her 
you know, past experiences in California. And then it goes on here to talk about the state of the union address, two aides close to the vice president and an additional source with familiar with the role said Harris will continue to bring awareness to this issue in the coming months with events that highlight expungements, especially as the reelection campaign seeks the support. Listen to this critical of young voters and voters of color. So here it comes folks. Here it comes. We can go to part two, Eric. I mean, if you're trying to figure out this issue, you just legalize it. You can release the people who are in jail for that. It's a plant. Now, I'm waiting for you, Eric. I'm going to show you something else. Because it's not just Fat Joe. When I talk about access and when I talk about people having access to people like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, I mean, this is the president and the vice president. It's not like you're having access to like Rashida Tlaib. She's a congresswoman, right? You're at a different level when you have access to, I'm oh, sorry. You're at a different level when you have access to the president and the vice president. That is a totally different game, right? So it's not just Fat Joe. It's also David Pakman. Because David Pakman said, last week, I was invited to meet with Vice President Kamala Harris at the White House to discuss a number of different issues, super interesting experience, and met some other content creators who have built massive audiences on different platforms. Yes, David, I'm sure the content creators that you met who were there with these massive platforms that you're referring to are people who are pro- Democratic Party, just like David Pakman. So you see how this works. Look at these pictures. David Pakman, who at one point in the time called himself progressive, was supporter of Bernie Sanders. Dave realized you can make more money if you just slide on over to supporting the establishment Democrats that he actually told you to fight against. So Dave decided to move with the money. So that's what happened there. Now, you look at the pictures here. There's David Pakman here to the left. There's Kamala Harris right here. You don't get that close to the vice president at a table in a meeting at the White House unless you are defending the Biden administration and you're kissing their ass. That's how it works. He was invited. He didn't ask to go. You don't see Kamala Harris inviting other people. I don't see Kamala Harris trying to invite people who have been critical of the Biden administration. And David Pakman has not. He's told lie after lie after lie and said, the economy is doing great and everything's da da da. Anything to kiss their butt. And that is to give you access. So what does that tell you? At this point in time, when you see that David Pakman, YouTuber David Pakman, has this type of access to the vice president, do you think if Kamala Harris does something wrong, well, she's done other things wrong, you think the next time Kamala Harris does something wrong, you think the next time Joe Biden does something wrong, David Pakman is going to call them out on it? No, he's going to defend them. That's how he maintains that access. And here's another picture of him here. David Pakman. Now, why is this important? You think about Fat Joe. You think about David Pakman. You think about Charlemagne the God. These people are invited because they're not critical of the administration. These people are invited because they kiss up to the administration. They defend it at all costs. They're not seen as a threat. The administration is not going to have this type of meeting with people who are critical of them. 
And this is important when I get to the next segment about unity. When I talk about how we can build and move forward. Because there's some people you cannot ally with. There are some people you cannot be in an alliance with. If you that close to Kamala Harris, you this close to people like Joe Biden, these people are never going to have our best interest at heart for those who are trying to fight for issues for the real left. And I don't mean Democratic Party. That's not left. I'm talking about those who believe in universal health care, who believe in canceling student loan debt, all of it, who believe in, you know, free public college, the real left, not the David Pakmans of the world. We can't ally with those people. You can't align with the fat Joe. You can't align with the David Pakman. These people are actually going to work against our interest. And they're going to do so to protect their access to those politicians and their brand. This is where we're at now. Fat Joe and David Pakman. Let's get to the, some of the comments uh, here. Actually, I'll take the Rockfin comment first. Take that one first, Eric, and then I'll go to the Super Chats. Uh, thank you for the tip, Roger. Joe need to lean all the way the fuck back, Sabby. <laughs> he ain't know who Joe Biden was as senator back when he was doing his street, his street shit, Sabby. I'm sure he didn't know who our own senators were back then. Matter of fact, be it Fat Joe, Joe Biden, Joe Lieberman, Joe Manchin, G.I. Joe, Cup of Joe, Morning Joe, all these Joes need to lean back instead of Joe Biden doing the rock away. He needs a rocking chair. <laughs> that was funny, Roger. That was good. Thank you, uh, Joseph. You get less unless it's for defense spending. Mm hmm. Uh, Z says, Sabi, good point about aiming high when setting negotiation parameters. Yes. So that's something I learned from my dad. Always ask for more than what you actually want, because a lot of times the offer is going to be less than what you ask for. So always ask for more. Uh, thank you, Eliezer. Uh, CNN has a vibrator, a vibratory. Oh, what? Well, thank you, Laser. <laughs> thank you, R. Bailey. Fat Joe is about Fat Joe and doing the rock away. I used to like that song too. Oh, you said this twice. Fat Joe is about Fat Joe. Thank you, Beauty and the Boomer. Sabby says it right from Beauty and the Boomer. Hey, guys, that's Chandra and uh, Oz. Uh, thank you, QWERTY. Fat Joe is Cuban and Puerto Rican. Bet you he didn't call for lifting the embargo nor addressing the celebrity settlers gentrifying the locals in Puerto Rico. Ouch. Damn, QWERTY. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jay. Didn't the Biden administration fire low-level staffers for smoking marijuana? They truly think we're idiots doing crap like this. That's right. I forgot about that. Good point. Now we're going to move on to unity and building movements. This conversation with Brianna Joy Gray and Cenk Uger, it revealed something. There's something I want to touch on about it. And for me, this is not about, you know, the personality issue. It's about how do we move forward? How do we build these movements? I'm going to show you an example of that with those of us over at RBN. Because what I noticed from this conversation is that part of the reason why movement building isn't happening is because there's too much focus on personalities instead of focusing on what you can do with people in the community and in the streets. So Brianna Joy Gray interviewed uh, Jank Uger and she is talking to him about, can the left finally 
unite. And uh, I know this is an interesting place to pause it, but this is the portion of the interview <laughs> that I want to discuss uh, because I know Jinx's face looks kind of funny there. But let's get into this discussion. Anyway, I don't think, right? Well, that's, so that I think put- is the main point. And I'll say this. You said earlier, like, I mean, just now the question of whether or not our influence is gone. I'll tell you this. A squad member reached out to me in the spring of that year. I don't remember exactly when it was, but within a few months of force the vote, literally scheduled to have a phone call with me because they wanted to know what was next. They were literally were like, okay, well, we didn't want to do force the vote because the art, what was told to me was that they found the rhetoric toward AOC to be personally offensive. It oh. wasn't a strategic, but wait a minute, but wait a minute, Jenk. to me, this is an indictment of them. They it's didn't say that they just dis- wait, but wait a minute. They didn't say that they disagreed strategically. They were so they were more concerned about vibes and feelings than a strategic opportunity. But now this congressman wanted to know from me, congressperson wanted to know from me, what's next? So that part right there is very telling. That you actually had squad members or one of them reaching out to Bree asking, okay, what do we do now? And that again shows you that there was no leadership uh, in reference to managing the politicians, the candidates that ran through Justice Democrats. There was no leadership after they won. It it just kind of seems like the organization, I don't know what happened, but it seems like the organization kind of was just hands off after they got into those positions. So it was interesting that one of them reached out to Bree and was asking, okay, what do we do next? It's really interesting considering how far away they are from all of us now. And granted, I didn't have a show uh, during Force the Vote at that time, but it's really interesting to see where it seemed like they were willing to still seek some type of advice uh, compared to how it is now. Interesting. And yeah. I said, there's nothing next, Congress member, because you squandered you this that? opportunity. Why did you say that? You should have asked for something. You there was nothing to down. ask for, Jank. There's no- Pause for a second. So this part I didn't understand from Jank. He's, he was upset because, you know, Bree didn't know, you know, what, what to tell them or say there is no next thing. And he said to Bree, well, why would you say that? First of all, it's not Bree's job to manage the members of the squad. She's not their manager. And, you know, that wasn't her job. In fact, Jenk, you and Kyle were the ones who created Justice Democrats. So it seemed like you should have been the ones that were hands on with them. I know you, you both walked away from that organization, but you guys were the ones that created the organization. It really was not Bree's job to, to lie <laughs> and tell them what's next. That's not on her. And so what I noticed is like Jink was Jank, excuse me, Jank was putting some of the blame here on Bree for certain things that really was not her job. Instead of pointing fingers at the squad members and for them not showing up when the time was needed. How do you just stay silent during a pandemic? And there is a call from you or call for you from the left asking you to push for a vote for Medicare for all. Yes, we all knew it wasn't going to pass. But the whole point was I watched that whole debacle. We knew it wasn't going to pass. But the whole point was to show us who's who. So that way you can also have people primary challenge those politicians and get them out of office and replace them with the people who actually do support universal health care. It was a very exposing moment considering the fact we were in a pandemic. The reality is. The squad decided to choose their political careers instead of fighting for universal health care. That's what the the reality is. So that's not Bree's fault, but yet Jenk is putting it on her. First of all, I'm a podcaster. I'm not sitting around. I don't. The genius of Force the Vote was that it was an amazing idea. It was such a good idea that I heard about it from Sam Cedar, who validated that Jimmy Dore, a mortal enemy, had a good idea. I was watching Sam Cedar. I didn't watch Jimmy Dore. I was watching Majority, Majority Report. And no, I heard, no, wow. No, no, this- Brianna, look, so when, when, it, remember, Jimmy was not a mortal enemy in the beginning of this. He called me about force the vote. And I said, mm-hmm. I generally, hey. wait <laughs> a minute. That's not true. That's not no, true. No, 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 no. Even, uh, even in the Sam Cedar segment that I was watching, he kind of made a little, jo- I'm not saying it was as bad as it is now, obviously, but he made a little joke about how, like, obviously I don't like, you know, Jimmy Dore and the dumb, dumb left. 
But even even I have to admit this is a good idea. It, it was built into the segment I watched. Brianna, that was why just, I went over to Jimmy Dore to hear more about it. Because I was like, if this Brianna, guy is validating it, Brianna, it must be something. You're just factually incorrect. No, Sam's, we can go back. Let's we'll see if we can go and try to pull right, that video. You know, go back and no, no, no. You're I remember missing it, it vividly. Please listen. Please listen. Sam Cedar has always hated Jimmy Dore. When they yeah, were that's, both, that's what I'm saying. God, boy, for God's sake, listen for a second. What I'm telling you is when they were both in the TYT network, I liked both of them. I had a perfectly good relationship with both of them. Sam Cedar hated Jimmy Dore and would constantly attack Jimmy Dore. What does any of this have to do with the squad not answering the call to fight for Medicare for all? Because this didn't just happen during force the vote. It also happened after force the vote. There were marches for Medicare for all, all across the country and over 50 cities across the country. The only person who showed up was Cori Bush and she showed up to the DC March, but then complained that she didn't appreciate what we were doing. You were here. Why? <laughs> what? How you show up to a protest and a rally just to tell us you don't like what we're doing. She could have stayed home for that. The, the, the point is, even after force the vote, they still weren't fighting for it. There were other opportunities that they could have participated in. AOC decided to go help Nina Turner's campaign instead of coming to neither one of the you what? So that has nothing to do. And I don't care who like who I don't care. I don't care about Sam Cedar not liking Jimmy, Jimmy not liking Sam. I don't really give a shit. That has nothing to do with the squad members who are the politicians at that point in time not showing up when the call was made. And I would try to get Sam to stop attacking Jimmy. At this point, when force the vote begins, at that point, I don't have any bad feelings. I didn't know that he had done the thing that he did to Anna. I, I didn't know that. So I had no bad feelings. So J Jimmy calls me and says, hey, do you want to do this force the vote thing? I go, hey, strategically, I think that that is the right path. I'm not sure about the tactics yet, Jimmy. And so let's keep talking about it. And in fact, you can go back and find videos of him saying, oh, Jenk agreed with me in the beginning. Jenk agreed with me. Yeah, that's right. Because I, as I've explained here for over an hour, I, I not only agree with that strategy, I was executing that strategy, but not this, that specific tactic. But when we said it, hey, I don't agree with this tactic, that's when Jimmy went rogue and started smearing everyone who didn't agree and went and made it a toxic cesspool. So that, and so Brianna, when they reached out to you and said, what's next? What happened was after we were done with force to vote, I was, a, a relevant issue came up, $15 minimum wage. That's where no, we this was after that. This was gone. This was okay. after that. There was no nothing problem. left. No problem. No problem. So let's say that that, that also passed. But when I asked for help there, everybody was like, no, we're mad at you. Jimmy's our boss. And he says, we're all mad at you. So we're not helping on okay. $15. Wait a minute. I thought we were a movement. Well, you're not helping on $15 minimum wage. What is wrong with you? I don't mean. Pause. So here's the problem that I noticed with this whole movement idea, at least coming from Jenk. Uh, <clears throat> Why does the movement rely on you having a coalition and support from other podcasters? Why does it rely on that? Jink has numerous resources. He has a network of people that he can contact, that he can reach out to. He has access to people that I don't have access to. Why does a movement rely on you having a coalition with podcasters? If some of those podcasters at that point in time were not willing to work with you in reference to moving towards the, the push for the $15 minimum wage. Okay. You couldn't organize no other people. You couldn't pull together any other people. Why not pull together people in the community? Why does this have to revolve around podcasters doing this? And that's the question that I have when we talk about movement building, are we talking about building a movement in the community, hitting the streets, or are we talking about building a movement with YouTube podcasters? I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves. You, I mean, generically, 
And then, okay, fine, we're past that. But Brianna, everybody then went like, I'm taking my ball and going home. No, brother, we got a two year window. That's, that's we not had what to we go did. And go I, to the next I don't know what was happening in thing. your world. And that's what I did. That's what I did. But everybody else left when their feelings were hurt. I don't know what was going on in your world, but that is absolutely not what's happening in my world. Nobody took their ball and went home, and we all forcefully pressured and talked about, to the best of our ability, the squad's failure to push on $15 minimum wage. Pramila Jayapal would be in the votes against them doing exactly that. And we covered it ad nauseum on this show and every other show on this side of the left that I remember. And while I got to say, Jank, you talked earlier in the podcast about reaching out and extending olive branches. I hope that that's true. And I hope I see that going forward. But you and I had our conversation on your show because I reached out to you and invited you on my show. And you declined, but said I could come on yours. And I did. And I'm glad we had that conversation. But I have not felt the ability. I have not felt olive branches reached out to me. And I have not felt the ability to reach out to other people. It was me that invited Sam Cedar in the wake of Force the Vote onto this show to have a conversation. And I have, Brianna, I, I if, you admit, wanna, if you want to get into that level of personal grievance, let no, me. No, it's not personal grievance. It's, it I'm is. really actually trying to bear that, bury the hatchet. I'm going to say that I think it's constructive. I, I hate, can I just be honest? I hate that there are all these people who are in my own community that I don't talk to anymore, that I don't, I can't have this guest on my show who I see making funny, informative, smart content, but I feel like can never bury the hatchet over something that was a, tactical disagreement that turned into saying some of the ugliest things. Again, I don't want to talk about the reasons I'm offended, but let's suffice it to say that I was grievously offended by some of the very personal things that were said at the time. But I just want to say at the record for the record right now, I would be more than happy to bury the hatchet going forward. I think, and this is what I wanted to ask you about. I'm happy to keep going if you have time, but if not, we can end it here. Let me pause for a second, because what this shows me again is that yeah, I totally hear you, Michelle. YouTube podcasters have a lot of reach. Totally. Thank you for saying that. I totally hear you. But here's the question I have. Should it be led by podcasters? Maybe the movement building should happen with activist groups and activist organizations on the outside. They can always come on to those shows and promote it and get the word out. But maybe it shouldn't be led by podcasters. Because movement building doesn't mean building within the YouTube space all the time. And I think that's the thing. I don't think these movements should be led by podcasters. I'm just keeping it real. I'm a podcaster myself, but I was an activist before I was a podcaster. I still do activism. I'm going to show you what that looks like. But what I'm saying is the reason, part of the reason is because of the personality differences, because all it takes is for one or two podcasters to have a disagreement with each other and the whole damn movement can fall apart. Whereas if you had an organization like PSL that is able to get a hundred, hundreds of thousands of people out into the street for the pro-Palestinian marches, if you have an organization like Answer Coalition put these kind of things together, you get past the podcaster personality differences. And I think, yes, those movements should always be promoted on these shows. Like, just like we've done the pro-Palestinian march promotions on these shows where people have come on. They should always do that. They should go into bad faith. They should go on to breaking points. They should go on to rising. Those things should still entertain in the space. They should still do that to get the message and the word out. But what I come to realize, uh, listening to this discussion between Bree and Jenk and thinking about all the things that happened with Force the Vote, I do not think it is a good idea for podcasters to lead any of these movements anymore. And I, I sincerely hope that does not hurt anyone's feelings. There's too many, you know, clashes. There's too much drama. There's too many personality, you know, differences. Everybody not on the same page. Uh, people be pissed off at each other for the stupidest reasons. So I think a movement should not be led by podcasters. And that includes you, Jenk, as well. But going forward, as we're trying to reconstitute the left in 2024 and get behind a candidate in the general election, what are we going to do? Because there are a number of candidates that are fracturing left attention right now. And I don't want this to be a situation where we have a fragmented left that disempowers our ability, especially with Gaza happening. 
um, disempowers our ability to put real pressure on the Democratic Party to stop a genocide. Yeah. So, look, definitely is my answer. Now, let me give you the context. So, at TYT, I have platformed literally hundreds of progressives, both candidates and hosts. We've started, what, half of the hosts that exist now in the progressive ecosystem at some point were at TYT and Young Turks. So, and I, and I kept going, and I'm still going to this day. We have dozens of hosts. And that's part of the problem. And I, I have to call this out. Yes, a lot of the shows did, a lot of these hosts did start at TYT or they were a TYT affiliate. So like Secular Talk was an affiliate of TYT. David Pakman started at TYT, uh, Sean King, you know, Humanist Report. A lot of them did get their start there. But that's part of the problem. Because a lot of those shows got their start at TYT, somewhere along the way, TYT became the gatekeeper for the progressive left, meaning that it had to start and end at TYT. So like the Medicare for all marches, for example, there was pushback because it didn't start and wasn't initiated at TYT, right? This call to move towards third party and independent candidates and go outside the duopoly, there was a lot of pushback because it didn't start, you know, at TYT. Uh, when we did the general strike summit over at RBN, we got a lot of criticism and pushback from people who are prominent figures that I didn't even know at that point in time uh, because it didn't start uh, at TYT. We didn't go through the proper channels. That's what we were told. So that is part of the problem. You have become a gatekeeper. And so if it's not starting with Jank Uger, if it's not his idea or Anna's idea or the TYT's idea, then it is dismissed by TYT. And that's not just force the vote. I told you about the Medicare for all marches as well. They didn't platform that either. Again, it has to be their idea. This is something I learned working with faculty members in higher ed. You know, I realized, figured out how to get along with faculty. You present an idea to them, but you make them think it's their idea. Isn't that crazy? But it works. So that's the thing. They are the gatekeepers. If it doesn't come from them, then it doesn't get mass support and it doesn't get massive exposure. Even though I know for a fact that a whole bunch of them will at some point turn on us and say outrageous and toxic and totally false things about us. But I still keep going and I still keep reaching out and I'm on this show and I went on and I had you on our show and I keep reaching out and reaching out and reaching out. And then every I mean, once I, in a while, I, 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 I instigated that, Jank. I, I, I reached saying, out like, to you. you. You're saying, hey, wait a minute. You I asked but, you to but, be but, on I a podcast. And, and so your hundreds of progressives that you have platformed and helped and launched into the world don't count. Because you didn't go I, on the podcast in exactly the right that. way that I wanted. No, I, it's quite the opposite. Quite the Come opposite. On. I think that the reason that I try to stay out of the personal stuff is because I think that what you do is enormously valuable. I think that what Sam Cedar does is enormously valuable. Those are huge platforms with smart people who share my politics 99% who are advancing my politics. And I would prefer not to say or do anything that diminishes their ability to do good work. Quite the opposite of what you're saying, in fact. Well, look, uh, there's, it, look, I would last two things that I, I got to go and do the Young Turks. Look, Rihanna, in my opinion, when a friend and an ally is attacked in a vicious and false way, and people can see this on tape, I get their back. This whole blogs and things that got me uh, smeared by the mainstream media started when I backed Sam Cedar when the alt right attacked him on some nonsense joke he did. Uh, pretending that he was a groomer, et cetera. You, you see, this is the problem. This is why uh, V says wrong takes savvy. Anyone can get their feelings hurt, even non-podcasters. Yes, you're right. Anyone can get their feelings hurt. The difference is those are organizations that have the resources and they have the experience, you know, putting forward those large ass rallies. This is why a PSL can get like 200,000, 300,000 with answer coalition and get all those people in the streets for the pro-Palestinian marches. Yes, 
People are going to butt heads in activist organizations too. Yes, I know I've been a part of them, but the difference is notice that the movement continues. Notice that the action still continues. Instead, what you end up with, uh, particularly with people like Jenk and all the other people that butted heads in reference to force the vote, there's a lot of ego. And this is something that really turns me off. I, I really am turned off by ego. So if I feel you got a huge ass ego, I will pedal away from you. I will pedal. I don't like it. I don't like it. So people didn't just get all in their feelings. People also exposed their ego. And if people aren't willing to let their ego go, you're not ready to lead no movement. And the movement leading, it should be horizontal. This is something we learned from the Black Panthers, right? Horizontal organization where everybody's on the same level, not this one solo person, you know, trying to call all the shots. And then you wouldn't have some of these issues. But when there's a lot of ego involved and you got people say, we're the ones who started this and everything started at my network and yada, yada. These people's egos have become inflated. And I, I've seen it over the years. I've seen it over the years. Jake Uger, Anna Kasparian, these people have huge egos. They can't sit up here and tell me that they don't. So until the ego goes away, how are you going to fix the personality differences? You see me defending progressives all the time when they are attacked because I've been through it a hundred times. When someone doesn't not so attack and, and he did it, I, I forget if he did it to Sirota first or Ryan Grimm first or whoever he did it. I was like, oh my God. And I went and rushed in for help. When you don't come and help and when you say I'm indifferent to it, I don't really care what he calls you. I'm going to call it whatever it is. Okay. I'm asking you going forward, can you just pause for us and not you just all just you, but the whole movement, can we all just pause for a second and go, wait, is it right for one of our own to attack someone in the movement with no basis in fact, in a way that is so maniacal that of course they're going to have, like, are we supposed to go, are we supposed to be dogs? And go, oh, yes, sir. Of course, we are backed by CIA, sir. Of course. But we will work with you nonetheless, sir. I mean, that is the most unbelievable ass. And so I'm asking you to think about it if it was you. I mean, look, we, I had you on a podcast and you caught feelings that I, you, that I didn't go on your podcast. That is so tiny no, compared I, to what we were called. No, and and I, I don't say this like it's <laughs> That's not like, the point. No, no. See how this goes nowhere? With him saying, no, no, you know, I was called a name. So-and-so said this about me, da-da-da. None of that has anything to do with the fact that the squad did not deliver during a time when we were in a pandemic. This policy, this, this strategy of force the vote came from the DSA handbook. It's right there in the DSA handbook. AOC is member of the DOC. Like DSA, they know this. They know what they're supposed to do when you have a small, when you have a narrow majority, you use that power to push forth for Medicare for all. It's right in the handbook. So when they act like they had no guidance, they didn't know what to do. The, the steps and the instructions were right there. Right there for you. Brianna, I'm not saying it to say ha ha to you. I'm saying it because I'm trying to evoke some degree of empathy from you guys. Do you not see that if somebody goes like you sense like 2% of it and you were worried about it, imagine if you got the whole thing because some lunatic starts saying that you're secretly being paid by Nancy Pelosi and then everybody goes, yeah, well, work with that. Brianna, it's your fault. Work with that person. Work with that person. It's your fault. You're starting to split the movement. You'd be like, what are you guys talking about? That's crazy. Why isn't anybody helping me? Why are they supporting this lunatic instead? but I can't get you to see that. And I don't think I'm ever going to get you to see that. Well, see how that goes? Why isn't anybody helping me? Again, it's about the ego. So I'm Jake, done with I, it. I don't want to go tit for tat. And I can sit here and, and pull up all the old tweets of the mean spirited, very personal. I spent most of February in my one, my studio apartment sobbing by myself. I didn't have a network. I didn't have TYT. Ryan Grimm was one of my closest 
fr friends and allies in this situation. He gave me my first job. I, I see him as a mentor and I felt like I couldn't even talk to him about it because things got so toxic. Like I, I, I can't, I, I can't, I, I don't want, I can't appeal to you by, by, with my humanity. So I don't, and I don't want to frankly go back there. It was one of the darkest times of my life, to be honest. I was so fucking depressed. Is the people surrounding him enabling him when he puts out ridiculous conspiracy theories, like calling me someone who's being funded by NATO because I interviewed Madeleine Albright once. So a uh, direct question to both Katie Halper and Brianna uh, Joy Gray. Do you guys think that I'm paid by NATO? So even this right here, why was she bringing Brie and Katie into this? You, you see what I'm saying? All of this so-and-so said this about me all of this is just was just a distraction instead of focusing on the actual issue at hand which was health care you can't who cares anna who gives a fuck if you know you're not being paid by nato you can go on this stream like you did and say you're not paid by nato and just let it fucking go I, these are adults. To me, it just, who gives a fuck, Anna? If you know you're not, then don't worry about it. But there was all of this bickering back and forth and stuff. And this is why I said, no, these movements should not be led by podcasters. Just going forward, they need to be led by people, the activist organization, the people already out in the streets, the people who knocking on the doors. Someone mentioned it here uh, in the chat. They said, yes, so uh, soccer papa says, Savvy, you're 100% correct. It's the same thing as a salesperson selling over the phone or via email versus the one who's knocking on doors. Yeah, like I, I just don't understand that. I look back on it and I think that was a mistake. Ay, ay, ay. And if you don't, why don't you say something? Do you think that uh, Sam Cedar is just a corporate shill? And if you don't think he is, then why don't you say so? I just think that this effort yeah. has been so destructive, so toxic, and so yeah. disgusting. And don't tell me not to focus on Jimmy Dore when they've decided to put Jimmy Dore front and center in this entire thing. Go. There goes again. So see what I was saying? Why you can't look. We've gone through forced to vote on this show multiple times before about some of the things that could have been different. But one of the things I will say here is, again, a lot of this had to deal with personality differences and ego. It's really sad. Actually, you look you look back on it. It is really sad because I think about what could have been done. If I can look at what I look like on the videos of January of 2021, I look not great. And so all, suffice it to say is that I could sit here and tell you all of the deeply hurtful comments that people in your orbit have made, but I truly have no interest in asking you to apologize for Nomiki Konst or Anna Kasparian or any of them. I don't care. They are all, oh, I'm responsible for their actions. You're responsible for yours. And frankly, I'm willing to bury the hatchet on it all. But you yeah. seem to no, have no, a I'm, different I, requirement of me. Rihanna, you want me. Let, 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 let me tell you this, Jank. I have no interest in throwing Jimmy Dora under the bus or casting aspersions or one way or the other. But I want to make clear, I have talked on the phone with him, I think, once, maybe twice in my entire life. And it was around um, organizing the Medicare for All rally that was held in January of 2021 in Washington, D.C., talking through logistics of how to put that together. I have had no other relationship with him other than what you see in public on Twitter I've maybe DM'd them a couple of times. Hey, did you see this clip? What do you go? You know, those kinds of things, including back during the campaign when, frankly, he got really mad at me at some point about something. I can't even remember what. Of course. He but this idea mad that, everybody for over everything. But, but the idea, but who cares? People have feelings and people get sentiment. Like, I, 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 we're different. I, I appreciate that. But, Jenk, you were just screaming at me at the Hill like a month ago and I decided to brush it off. I don't care. Like you call me a bunch of names on the hill. We'll slice, splice that in too. But I'm just trying to encourage you to maybe have a little bit of a duck water roll off kind of attitude to some of this and stop requiring that everybody kind of fight your battles or we'd all be mad at each other. Half of my audience wants me to hate David Sirota. I don't want to. I like David Sirota and I think he is intelligent and valuable in this space. Same with Ryan Grimm. And it's okay. They can wish I had a different attitude to them. 
I can wish they had a different attitude to them, but they can still like me and I can still like them. And that's okay, right? Why can't that be okay? So A, definitely. B, uh, look, if you think David's, like, I'm not saying you. Uh, obviously, you just said you're good with them. <laughs> if you think David's Corona, so I will tell people in your audience so they can get mad at me all over again. If you think David Sirota and Ryan Grimm are not intelligent people that are very, very helpful to the progressive movement, you have no earthly idea what you're talking about. Well, so first and foremost, again, going back, he's going back to the personalities. Who cares? Well, why do you care, Jink? Why do you care what people think about Ryan Grimm and David Sirota? Who gives a fuck? What does that have to do with the freaking movement? Because you see, I want to bring up the example of the civil rights movement. Do you guys think during the civil rights movement, everybody got along? Because they didn't. Do you think people in the civil rights movement, activists didn't butt heads? Oh, yes, they butt heads. They even butt heads with the NAACP. Because the NAACP weren't too keen on them doing that, that march on Washington, by the way. I don't know if everyone knows that. They were not on board for that in the beginning. So there were activists that were a part of that, that butt heads. You think people that were part of the women's rights movement didn't butt heads? Yes. There's always going to be disagreements. But notice how they still accomplish the task at hand. The problem that I have, particularly within the podcast space, when I look at the activism part, is that the tasks don't get accomplished because people can't get past the bullshit. And maybe that has to deal with, or maybe that has to be part of like not having experience in activism, but I have experience in activism and there's always going to be bullshit. There's always going to be conflict and everybody's not going to agree on everything. But the goal is to accomplish the task at hand. And so that's why I continue to say, I don't think these should be led by podcasters because the reality is if you have a show, and you choose to try to start like some type of movement or whatever. Yeah, there's going to be people button heads and stuff like that. But because you're the one that's on camera and if you're the one that started it, when shit goes wrong, everyone's going to be looking at you on camera and blaming you. Just like when Justice Democrats failed, when the squad failed, who did people point their fingers back at to? Jake Uger and Kyle Kalinske. Because people said, you guys were the ones that started this Justice Democrats. You're the ones that told us to go out there and support the squad. Now they're in there and they're not fighting for us. What say you? But I think we are a great vehicle for people to promote those actions on. I just don't think we should lead it. I just don't think we're talking about a big, massive type of move. I think we need to leave that to the organizations that are already out in the streets and let them do it. They those don't, are the two they don't doubt best their intelligence. reporters that we have. They're the two most honest, smartest, strongest people we have. So they don't doubt their intelligence, Shank. What they what they criticize because people are allowed to make narrow criticisms of folks that have also positive attributes. What they criticize is to to the extent uh, them to the extent that they, in their reporting, perhaps is too credulous of the incentives of squad members and gives them too much benefit of the doubt, and in effect, constructively, whether or not it's their intent runs cover for the squad as they do things like, as we, we agree on, fail to use their leverage at any point during that small margin 2021, 2022 term to advance the values and goals of the left. Okay. Right? Can't so, that right? Because you get to write a book about the squad. If you're Ryan Grimm, you get to write a book about the squad by having access to the squad. And in order to have access to them, you have to be nice towards them. You have to give them favorable coverage. That's another example why I don't think people in this space should lead these movements. The access issue was another one. Can't that no, be a thing? But, the, but again, that's super unfair to them because they they did exactly the right thing. They thought it was the wrong tactic to use in the beginning. And then when it came time to use the tactic, they were 100 percent right. And they did put that pressure on. So well, look, they I were, talked to Ryan about it. I talked to Ryan about it on this show and he conceded and people can read it, hear his own words, but for themselves, I don't mean to mischaracterize him. You can go back and listen to that episode from the summer of 2021, but he conceded some pretty important points about the strategic considerations that were being made at the time and the arguments that he was making at the time, some of which 
were not accurate. Okay. I'll leave it at Look, that. It, it, if you if you are so hopelessly radicalized that you think Sirota, Grimm, and me are sellouts, then no one will ever be anywhere near pure enough for you. And I don't. So we're going to fast forward just a little bit, but that just proves again what I was saying about too much focus on the personalities instead of the issue at hand. And uh, EG, you hit on this as well. The focus should always be on the issue. Damn the personalities. That's right. That's right. Uh, this part right here. Yeah. And, and, and Brianna, why am I on here? My campaign's over. There's no reason to be on here other than to go forward. Right. Well, so I appreciate from, that. I really do. I, yeah, I really so, do. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I was going to say, for God's sake, not just with me and you, but with the audience. Yeah. Okay. Even if you just caught feelings about what I said about Sirota and Grimm, and you think that they're whatever they are. I don't want to recharacterize it. Okay. But you have your beef with them for whatever reason. And you have your beef with me for whatever reason. Money. If you believe the outrageous things, then you're probably not going to work with us. Like who wants to work with a guy funded by Nancy Pelosi? Okay, fine. Right. So, okay. Don't please. Then I don't want to work with you. You don't want to work with me. Great. We agree. Right. But for everyone else, for everyone else that for God's sake cares about the movement, passing bills, because guys, whether I win, somebody else wins, somebody was the face, the other person was the face, someone's the leader, the other one's the leader. Who cares? If you don't pass the bills, then we all collectively have done nothing. So first of all, a correction here, there is no progressive movement. The movement actually ended when the squad turned their back on us. And then also when Bernie Sanders walked away from the movement. There, there's no progressive movement. I don't know why he's pretending like there still is, but there isn't. <laughs> so, you know, so, so, so there's that. There's that. We must unite. We must unite to try to keep our eyes on the prize, which is to actually pass these bills. So what I'm doing next, Brianna, is I'm taking the kernel of the, the volunteers at center that I had on my campaign and I'm starting something called Operation Hope and I'm going to try to bring it over to TYT, it's in transition, etc. And, and if you find it, if you stumble across it at some point and you like what we're doing, great. No one has any obligation. No one, you don't worry, you could hate me and you don't have to do it and you could be like bah humbug on hope. I don't want it or I don't want it with you. Anything's fine. But if you're it, say, hey, you know what? It seems like a worthy effort. Maybe if we get together, we can organize the internet and organize our movement and organize young people in a way that could actually help the rest of average Americans. Well, what is it? That would so here we go again. So you see part of the problem here? Here he is again trying to start another thing or a new thing, right? What is it, Jay? What is Operation Hope? So what I'm going to do is I I'm going to try to create a central hub where... Because our videos and our memes go to a lot of people, go to millions of people, and two, 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 great, wonderful, I'm happy about it. But it's not enough. You have to create an amplifier. Part of the reason that I try to get on mainstream media, which is now hopeless, is because they have the amplifier. Whatever they say gets amplified a thousand times over by the rest of media covering, right? And that's a huge advantage that the establishment has and that the progressive movement doesn't have. So I decided, well, okay, we can't break into that. They've got us, I've got, I'm canceled on all three cable networks and that's now confirmed. Uh, so, so instead, we're, I'm going to try to bring it up from social media because social media can be an amplifier. So for example, mm -hmm. I'll throw out one idea, but I want in our town halls and in our slacks, et cetera, for, for all of us to come up with the idea together and to push together and to come up with tactics together. And, and by the way, as we do that, there'll be slight hurt feelings. So they didn't do my tactic. They did the other tactic, et cetera. But we can't let that affect us. we got to stay on the same boat. And so one p potential example is the Ohio ballot measure for higher minimum wage. Nina Turner's in Ohio. Her group is already trying to help with that measure. Ballot measures are direct democracy. It's one of the few places we have left for direct democracy. And that we could all begin to influence the social media and get enough attention to it so that it passes. But I give you that as just one of hundreds of examples that we can come up with together and then act together, act together online and then act together in the real world. So see what I mean? How once again, it has to go through TYT. 
they have to be the one to initiate it. When we talk about coalition building, I think in reference to electoral politics, for me, it's whether or not are you still a part of the duopoly or are you post duopoly? I am post duopoly. So in reference to coalition building, if you're trying to work with me and basically say, Hey, get together with me and help us, you know, get this Democrat candidate, da, da, da. It's a no for me. Uh, that window has passed. I have already been a part of the democratic party. So not going back into that for me now, so in reference to electoral politics, if you still trying to work within the Democratic Party, I'm not interested in working on that project. Uh, that's just me. I can't speak for everybody else. When it comes to the grassroots and actions on the ground and things on the outside, depending on what it is, that could be a different story. But when it comes to electoral politics, I am not trying to work within the duopoly to get anything accomplished. I think it is a mute point at this point in time, right? I appreciate that he mentioned the ballot uh, initiatives and ballot measures. I've been covering those for over a year. I do think direct democracy uh, is important. Important. A lot of the progressive issues have passed, but they passed on the local level, uh, not on the national level. And I think ballot measures and ballot initiatives are incredibly overlooked uh, in reference to a, a larger part of left independent media. And I do think there should be more attention given to that besides me. <laughs> I, I support that endeavor. I feel strongly that a lot can be done with the United uh, Left Media. We struggle in a way that right independent media doesn't because they are very well funded um, because their interests align with corporate interests. But I think the Bernie campaigns demonstrated that we have a lot more power than we think we do when we do unite. So I look forward to hearing more about that. Quick round robin, Jank. Going into the general election, the non-Biden candidates, Jill Stein, Cornell West, RFK Jr. Do you have a fighter? No, I'm going to try to get uh, some or maybe all of those folks on the show and hear them out because uh, I think that they deserve to be heard out. Uh, so that right there was interesting because that goes to show you, I don't watch TYT, I haven't watched in a long time, but that goes to show you he hasn't had them on the show yet. RFK Jr. I can get RFK Jr. is kind of skittish uh, certain parts. He won't come on to like progressive media. It, it, he's kind of skittish. And I know other people that have reached out. Um, but you haven't had on Cornell West or Jill Stein yet or Claudia De La Cruz. All this time has gone by. No, because they're focusing on the Democratic Party. And if if you made me pick one now, I you know, I think Cornell West is kind of an easy one there's a lot of things i don't agree with rfk jr on and i think uh but we have to see if it's you know then we might get into tactical disagreements at a later time in the election cycle about whether to support well, what about or dr dr stein because uh because of ballot if, if if only because of uh ballot access reasons yeah which cornell west I, is look, struggling with so it gets complicated because i think third parties if we had an effective third party, it could be a lifesaver. Um, on the other hand, they have not been effective so far. So if at the end, everybody takes two to 3% from Biden. Now at this point, I, I dislike Biden so much. It, it's, I mean, I, it's not a matter of whether I want Biden to win or not. I hate his policy on Gaza. I think, I don't think he's a sweet, empathetic man. I think he's monstrous in a lot of ways, but the very worst outcome is Trump winning. And so you have to be strategic in figuring out, you know, which way is that vote going to go at the end? But we're not there yet. So this is a point that I wanted to get to right here. So essentially, uh, he's still willing to cave to Joe Biden. He's still willing. He may not do so himself, but still willing to tell people we can't get Donald Trump. When you say to your audience, we can't get Donald Trump, you're telling them to vote for Joe Biden. You may not say vote for Joe Biden, but you are telling them to vote for Joe Biden. And that is really important, right? So it is very obvious uh, that there is a, a segment that wants to continue to work within the duopoly and a segment that wants to work outside of the duopoly when it comes to electoral politics, at least. 
And what's really interesting to me is that, because I watched this full interview, a lot of the discussion around force the vote and what did not happen and what could have happened, it seemed like to me, listening to what Jenk said, he basically let one person, one personality, or actually a couple, per couple different personalities uh, decide or affect how things were going to move in reference to the next action for $15 minimum wage push uh, with the squad. You let one person personality or one or two personalities, I think mean, Jimmy and Sam Seeger, you let two personalities affect how you were going to movement build for the $15 minimum wage to move forward with that. Why were you relying on getting the support of those people? And again, I go to the civil rights movement. Guess what guys? Not everybody that was a civil rights activist at that point in time got along with Dr. King. Not everybody agreed with some of the strategies and the tactics that they were planning. Guess what? They also had arguments over slogans, just like we do right now, right? We had ar uh, arguments over defund the police slogan, arguments over from the river to the sea slogan. They had some of the same problems when they were organizing back then. So I guess the question that I have guys is, number one, there is always going to be some type of tension. There are gonna be people that you may not agree with. You may have, you know, drag out arguments or fights with these people, but you should never let one or two people like basically affect some type of movement going forward for the next action. And that's exactly what Jenk did. I don't know if you guys realize that, but that's exactly what Jenk Uger did. He let what happened during force the vote between a couple of personalities affect whether or not he was gonna build some type of movement to push for the $15 minimum wage. You could have still done that movement without those people. You didn't need to have those people on. You think everybody that was a part of the civil rights movement stayed on to the end or stayed on to the March on Washington? No, some people came, some people left. Some people came, some people left. There's always going to be disagreement. You also gonna have opposition. And you can see film, you know, footage of civil rights activists beaten by the police officers, officers, hosed, had dogs sicked on them. They didn't let that stop them from the task at hand. And yet we had podcasters and Jake is telling you he let that stop him from the next task at hand in reference to movement building. That does not make any sense. Not everybody is gonna agree with you. Not everybody's gonna have your back. And just because a couple of people did not have your back, Jank, so you just decide just to not move forward with the next project to put pressure on the squad because you didn't get the approval or the agreement with Sam and Jimmy and all these other people, who gives a fuck? Not everybody is going to go down your path. Not everybody is going to be on the same journey with you when you take that journey. Sometimes you may have to walk alone, but you still could have organized with the people that were willing to work with you and push for the $15 minimum wage. I think the focus on the personalities was also a distraction for you to not have to be able to do what you needed to do. You have a large platform. Why did you need to have Majority Report and the Jimmy Dore Show on for your project that you wanted to do? You didn't need to. These are the things I never really understood. Make it make sense to me, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody, can you make it make sense to me? TYT has over 5 million, 5 million subscribers. More subscribers than the Jimmy Dore Show. And I think more than Majority Report, I have to double check. You had the most subscribers. Why did you need these other two people to be with you? Moving forward, I think this is what we should be focusing on. Because over at RBN, 
We organize. We do outreach. Not through electoral politics. Over at RBN, if you go to our website, you'll see the RBN chapters. So all of us, each one of us have a chapter. We launched it in May of 2023, right? Look at some of the things we do. These are the goals. Building a community library. Rome is working on that. We give out diaper and baby supplies, school supplies, disability community outreach, feeding the poor and the unhoused, housing activism, bill payment assistance. Like this is what we focus on. This is what, when you guys see me on YouTube, when I'm not on YouTube, in fact, I have a meeting for this tomorrow. When I'm not on YouTube, this is what I'm doing. So it just, all the chapters here, there's me for the, there's the Boston chapter. There's JB. He has the Orlando chapter. Rome has the Detroit chapter. Rome probably does the most out of all of us. Like Rome is building the library. Nick has the Kansas city chapter. And CJ has the Long Beach chapter. And here's the thing, you know, uh, TYT has way more resources and a larger network than we do. Imagine what they could do if they did something like this. Imagine how many people they could help with their massive platform. We're doing the best that we can with the platform that we have, but do you imagine what this could be if TYT did what we're doing? But no, they're not. They're, they're sitting there arguing about Jimmy Dore and Sam Cedar. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> Who gives a fuck? I used to buy into that too. I used to buy into the personality bullshit, but I feel like this show has evolved a lot over the past year and a half. And I had to pull away from that because I realized it wasn't helping anything. It wasn't helping anything. So you can also see if you go to outreach, tour for the poor, because Rome does tour for the poor and tour for the poor is actually, uh, actually became a nonprofit thanks to Rome. He organized all of that, right? Nick is a co-founder of 10 Demands to Justice. And I'm showing you this because a number of times people say, we're not doing anything. RBN, you don't organize, you don't do anything. Those are lies. 10 demands for justice, road to abolition, of course, community mutual aid. There's me and a couple of things. What am I doing here? I forgot this. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. People say we don't do on the ground reporting. We do on the ground reporting. Hell it was cold that day. Let me bark away from that. That was a cold day. You know, lots, lots of these things that we do that people say we don't do. I was at Julian Assange rally in DC. I spoke at this event. Like this is the type of stuff that I focus on. I talk to you about politics on YouTube. I interview people in the community. At the end of the day, I keep telling you these politicians are not going to save you. So I have something when November is over and a lot of people will go back to sleep after election season is over. You got to have something to go to. And this is why I continue to say, push the organizing, push those things. This was tour for the poor, us giving out pizzas, us giving out clothes. You see this? Rome, free barbecues, all these different things that we do that people claim we don't do. We put these things together. Feeding people. Rome actually gives people free haircuts. Cutting people's hair. Building benches for people. In communities that have bus stops with no fucking bench. These are the kind of things that we focus on. So, this is why I continue to say, there's the library when Rome first got the building. Still doing construction and things on the library. And no, people may not always agree with our politics and that's fine. But the people in the community know that they can count on us to come through. And that's the question we need to start asking. Can you count on these people to come through? Can you count on Jenk Uger to come through in the community? It, it's painful to me. It's painful to me when I see the amount, the amount of, of resources that people like Jank Uger has. Now, Brie has donated to these types of things. Brie has contributed to these types of things. She's amplified these types of things. There has never been a time where Jank 
who says he wants to do these movements, never been a time, and he knows who we are, never been a time where he reached out to ask us to come on the TYT to talk about this. Not once. Never been no time. You're not trying to build on no movements. You're not trying to help people in the community. This is where it starts, at on the ground. Ground zero. That's where it starts. It doesn't start in D.C. It doesn't start with AOC. It doesn't start with Bernie. It doesn't start with these people. It starts with us. And if you look at what the Black Panthers have been, have been doing over the years, they had the right model. They had the right idea. They knew that the government was not gonna come through. So they built their own clinics. They started the free breakfast program. You wanna know why schools have a free breakfast pro program? The Black Panthers started that. So those are the things that we do to help people because we know these politicians, they failed us a long time ago, man. They failed us a long time ago. You go to these communities, my parents' neighborhood in Baltimore still looks the same way it did when they grew up in it. It still looks like trash. These politicians, I haven't helped these people. Where were the politicians when you needed to put food on the table? Were they giving you free food? What were the politicians when you got evicted? These are the kind of conversations that we have to start having. These are the kind of things we need to talk about. Thank you, Leroy says, my family members were Black Panthers. Yeah, and these are the kind of things, and this is why I'm saying, we have to find other ways to come together. And I do just feel like the focus is misplaced. The personalities are not going to help you. <laughs> These people are not going to help you. You see who's helping you. Rome is helping you. The RBN library in Detroit, building a library for people in Detroit. These are some of the pictures here. That was some of the work that Rome and his friend did this. You see, we don't have the kind of funds to hire a crew to do this for. We got to do this work. So these are the things that Rome did. The building was old. They know how to do, you know, drywall and all this stuff. I don't know how to do drywall, but they know how to do all this stuff. All these things that people pretend don't exist. We're not doing nothing though. You see this? That's community activism. This is how you help the people. You're not going to help the people by arguing about Jimmy Dore and Sammy C Sam Cedar. And the reason why these things are not highlighted is because again, it takes away from electoral politics. And if it takes away from electoral politics, that can affect a brand like TYT. You can talk about both. I talk about both. But there's no reason why you should be putting your money towards electoral politics anymore at this point in time. Notice I bring candidates on the show, but I never tell you to donate to them. Eric, can you put the link to the RBN website in the chat so people can see it? Yeah, it should be there. That's what I want. I want you guys to do. Like, you guys still, you can still vote. You want to vote, you know, I support a third party movement. I support that. But what I'm also saying is like, I don't want us to ever believe, I don't ever want you to leave this show thinking that that is the end all be all because it's not. So these are things that we can do. Comments. I actually have to take a break. I really do have to pee. Eric, could you do super chats really quick? I really got to pee. I don't know if Eric can hear me. Sorry, I've been talking too long and I've had a lot of water and the bladder has hit me. Um, oh, Eric was there. Now he's gone. I'm sorry, Eric. I know you weren't prepared for this, but I really do have to pee. <laughs> well, we do have the uh, super chats. Thanks. Is it uh, time for a savvy save? 
<laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Um, going from the background to the foreground, but that's all right. Um, yeah, let's see. We do have a good number of Super Chats built up. Let me check how my volume levels look. Yeah, I think we're looking pretty good here. Um, all right, let's see. We got for some Super Chats. Um, thanks for this one, uh, Bilal Mega. Uh, thanks for the Super Sticker. Um and also, thanks for this one. I guess we also call this a super sticker from New Beginning. Appreciate that. Thank you. And from Team Orca, people showing their um, showing their support. And um, uh, it, it, people are asking if we're doing call-in. I know this is this is what we usually like do before the call-ins, but I think this is really just more of a um, of a of a break needed. Um, as far as I know, we're not doing call-ins tonight. Um, uh, thanks for the super chats. Uh, NY Varsity Sports. Uh, Bree is not just a podcaster. She ran Sanders' campaign. She was the right one for the squad to come to. Could have been instrumental if they let her. Mm -hmm. And thanks for the super chat, Sparky. Even long before it was in the DNC handbook, it was a well-known and common tactic. Yeah, talking about uh, forcing the votes and you know the idea of, of how you can even um, have a, a minority of, of um, in this case, progressive uh, Congress people come in and, and essentially have demands. Actually, I want to talk about demands in a second. Um, thanks for the super chat, Elizabeth Marshall. Jenk often feels sorry for himself. Yeah, I mean, you know, some he's really just brings a, a toxicity in, into the whole dialogue. And, and I think that's his role. I mean, I think that's part of how he makes his money. And, you know, frankly, I think it's a mistake to, to have him on and treat him like like an honest actor, you know, because he, he's, he's just simply not. Um, thanks for the super chat, ad, a kid, ad kid. Uh, Sabby, happy belated birthday and much love and respect to you and RBN. Um, and yes, E.G. Butler saying the focus should always be on the issue and, and damn the personality. Thanks for this super chat, Sir Bikes a lot. You can't go through the net. They're monitoring it. You'll have to organize through sites like Telegram in which the servers aren't located in the West. And thanks for the super chat, Sparky. When people accuse Sabby of getting all dolled up for her show, just for me, I tell them Sabby doesn't need to get dolled up. She always looks that great. Um, and thanks for the super chat, New York Varsity Sports. Christian Smalls did not do a head count on people who had disagreements with him outside the issue at hand. That's how you win. Um, and thanks for this super, uh, thanks for this very generous super chat, uh, Lee uh, Royster. A great segment. Thanks, Sabby. And thank you, Lee. Um, very much appreciate your generosity. Um, and thanks for the super chat, Helpful Harm. I would really love to work with a New York chapter if we can get one going. NYC, Hudson Valley, Albany. Um, and you can, um, you could try to uh, 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 get in touch with, with RBN. You know, there are um, uh, contacts and whatnot if you want to work on something like that, I think. Thanks for the super chat, Sparky. Uh, Denazify Israel. And we got a few more here. Another one from Sparky. Uh, build a better world with bricks. And thanks for the super chat. Snork Y2K. Honest P deserves an okay. And thank you for the super chat. Uh, Sparky. Go Yemen fight the power. I appreciate that. And um, yeah, well, I have a minute. I mean, one thing I wanted to throw in here is, is what I would say is missing from... Um, from the, the Brie and Jank conversation and from this whole idea of like, why isn't, aren't things getting done is I think we, we have to, to have clear and concise demands when it comes to, to, to movements and, and what we're doing. And if, if we don't have like a clear demand, what, I mean, it, you know what I'm going to say is my thing I'm always working on is, is MCDS um, money, corruption, demands, and solutions. And, so these conversations, in my opinion, should always start with first with the money. Are you are you talking about start with the why, right? The answer to all questions in politics to me ends up with the dollar signs, the money. 
And so, I mean, the, the Brie and Jenk conversation, like didn't even, didn't even talk about that. It's like, you know, the whole Congress is bought and paid for and they can't even bring it up. You know, they're corrupt, the C. When the conversation goes there, then it then it's pretty easy to know that then the next step is a demand. You know, you've got to get the big money out, right? The whole Congress works for the billionaires, for the playthings of the billionaires, the mega corporations, the military industrial complex. And so there's the demand of get the big money out, and then you know, that flows pretty easily to the solutions once you're there. And I think if we had movements and conversations and whatnot that really had that as the core, the demands, and and keep, always keep an eye on that money and corruption, I, I think that can kind of short circuit some of these personality disputes. If we had yeah. this, this, this clear set of, of demands, and you know, I'm urging you know all people out here on the real left. Oh, thank you, TJ. No, thanks, thanks to everybody. the The chat is always very positive, and I, I when I'm on, and I, I do appreciate that. But I, I would challenge you know everyone on what I would would consider honest actors on the left and organizations and whatnot. What do, what are your demands? You know, and you know, are you really fo keeping the focus on them and on the powerful? Right. And uh, take the focus away from being about personalities. And if you don't want to work <clears throat> with with certain people, then just don't work with them. Why do you need all those people on board, you know, for you to do what you got to do? Just organize with people in the community. And I think that's what 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 drove me crazy about this when I think back on it is the fact of when I look at the resources that TYT has, like they they were they're bigger than all of us. See, they're, and they're it's not really, and it's not really, it's not accidental, right? The, the system encourages and funds that kind of nonsense. And if we're out here saying, you know, what about the billionaires? What about the military industrial complex and all these dishonest actors? Well, you know, then the system's like, oh no, they're they're radical, they're weird. And so I think it, it's important to to focus on those things and 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 re to really get somewhere. Right. And if you want to see about those things, like if you go over to uh, Revolutionary Blackout Network on YouTube, you can see like we did a, a activist edition of the General Strike Summit. Right. We did an anti-imperialist summit in 2022. We did we did a third party summit like we we've hosted these summits that are like, you know, 10 hour days. We did the the very first uh, general strike summit where we had these conversations. And I mean, like it, to me, it's just very concerning because people are asking, what do we do? Where do we go? Like the information is all there. We had a number of activists, you know, come on to this, uh, activist edition general strike summit and told us exactly how they did what they did. In fact, Chris Smalls was one of the guests that came on for that. So there's several, there's a lot of resources, you know, that you can go to if you're interested in becoming involved in activism. The problem is, is that the YouTube algorithm does not promote these types of things. Like when we do these types of anything about labor, uh, general strike, that kind of stuff, it doesn't, it's not pushed out heavily into the algorithm. Uh, whereas, you know, talking about personalities is, and that's the unfortunate thing. But I mean, all these things are, are, are on our channel. Uh, and we had a number of guests come on and, and talk about these issues and solutions and how you can move uh, forward. There have also been solution panels and solution summits and things like that. So the thing is, it's like when people say, well, I don't know what to do. The resources are there. It's just a matter of fact of whether or not you want to actually look at what's there for you. And no, we don't we don't have a lot of money. Uh, we do the best that we can. We fundraise, you know, Tour for the Poor is a 501, you know, it, it's a nonprofit. Rome travels all across this country. He's been to Jackson, Mississippi, delivering water to people. He's going to deliver more water to Flint, Whip, Michigan, but he travels all across this country helping people. And so for me, I just feel like we are wasting our time when we're arguing over who's more, like Jenk said, who's more toxic. That's not getting anything done. If you feel like someone is toxic and you don't want to work with them, then just don't work with them and move forward. And I, I constantly bring back the civil rights movement because I think people 
when they talk about it today, you know, we talk about it in positive terms. But what people have to understand is during that time, the civil rights movement was not popular. Uh, people like MLK and all the other civil rights activists had a lot of opposition against them, more against them than with them. Right. And they were able to get 250,000 people at the March on Washington before the Internet, no social media. And they, they organized and did what they did. So the thing is, how do you do that? You get past the disagreements. You get past the personality uh, differences. And if people don't want to be on board, move on without them. You don't need to have every Tom, Dick, and Harry be a part of a project in order for you to move forward with it. You'll never get anything done that way. You think everybody agreed with Chris Smalls trying to unionize at Amazon? No, they didn't. No, 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 agreed. not everyone at Amazon agreed. In fact, they faced tremendous uh, opposition. There's always going to be that. But as long as you continue to sit up here and focus on the personalities for the reason why you can't move forward with any type of movement, you're just honestly just using that as an excuse to not move forward yourself. And it's more profitable to sit up there and talk about the personality disagreements and to get the clicks and the views than it is to get your ass up off your seat and get out into the streets. That it just is what it is at this point. Before I drop in, before I clear out, I'll just finish with saying that the movements that succeed have clear demands. Yes. Yes, absolutely clear demands, but we can do these things guys. We can do these things. And I just think if people pivot away from who's toxic, who's not toxic or whatever, pivot away from that and focus on the people that do want to build a coalition with you, then we can get somewhere. But if we constantly do these back and forth of this person said this, this person said that, you're not going to get anywhere. All right, I got to go. All right, guys, have a great weekend. I'll be live again on Sunday. Other than that, have a good night. Keep up the fight.